good at being classist. All right, uh, let me plug that. Plug the hole. Plug the there you hole. go. Cool. She's got it. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, oh wait a minute. There you go. I'll just plug it in there now. Yep. All right. It's plugged into the wall. Right here in the wall. Into the wall. Just hit the. That should be. Is that it? I don't know. Is that coming on? Okay. Oh, okay, cool. We're good. Ready? Thanks. Let that go. Please get ready to start. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to call back to order the Pasco County Board of County Commissioner meeting of February 9th, 2021. I would like to remind everyone present to please silence all electronic devices and mute your microphones. Now's the time for public hearing um, agenda. There are no ordinances on the agenda today. Now we will proceed with the procedures for rezoning. Mr. Steinsteiner, please review the procedures for rezoning. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, there are two rezoning agendas, regular and consent. Staff will present each application to the Board of County Commissioners. If staff or planning commission has recommended approval and there's no opposition, the application will be considered by the board without further presentation. If the staff or planning commission has recommended denial, or if there is opposition to the application, the applicant will be given five minutes for presentation. The opposition will be given three minutes for each individual or five minutes for a group representative. And the applicant will be given three minutes for rebuttal. Any individual disagreeing with staff or planning commission recommendation or anyone wishing to object to any condition of the rezoning may at this time request the petition be pulled from the consent agenda, in which case that application will be heard later on during the regular agenda, later on during the meeting. Otherwise, all rezoning applications will be on the consent agenda will be approved by a single motion and vote. If you wish to speak to any petition, please give your name and address and whether or not you've been sworn for the record. These are quasi-judicial public hearings. The law in Florida is that mere public support or opposition of an application is insufficient for this board to take action. Please limit your comments to those criteria found within the board's land development code. We have three public hearing items on the consent agenda. These items will be approved with one vote without uh, presentation unless there is someone here in objection. Those that have pre-registered or are in the public comment kiosk speak to any of the items on the public hearing agenda prior to speaking, you will be sworn in by the clerk. Madam Clerk, from the list provided, properly swear in each person. All right, if there is anyone here to speak on the matters um, during the public hearing, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, so help you God? Okay. We assume they all said aye. So. Okay. Okay, um, first item is, is a continuous on P53, so do we read that or? I have to give the proof. Okay, the proof. Um, for item P53, it was published in the Tampa Bay Times on October 28th, 2020. P53 is PDD 210048. It's for a comp large scale comprehensive plan amendment. The request is for a continuance to the March 9th, 2021 BCC meeting at 1.30 in Dade City. Okay. We don't need a comment need for a, that. You, you don't need public comment, but you do need a motion. To I need a motion. Move to continue, Tom Certain. Move to a continuance? Move to continue, right. Do one now. So you've got three motions. <laughs> yeah. I believe Commissioner Mariano was first. So <laughs> yeah. we have a second. I got a motion by Mariano. I'll, I'll second, second that one. If we have a second, second I think we had three what motions. What is the motion? Okay. I have a motion and a second. I roll call vote. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, <laughs> Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. <laughs> one, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed five zero. P fifty four. P fifty four was published in the Tampa Times on January thirteenth, twenty twenty one. 
Denise Hernandez Planning and Development, P54 is PDD 217518. It's for a zoning amendment for Trinity Corporate Center for a change in zoning from I-1 Light Industrial Park District to an MPUD, Master Plan Unit Development District. And this comes to you with a recommendation of approval with conditions as included in your agenda packet from both the Planning Commission and the, and the Planning and Development Department. Is there anyone here to speak against this item? There is no one on WebEx and no one and anyone at the kiosk to speak against this item there is nobody at the kiosk for this item okay i need that move for approval oh, that's... No, move. Second. item stays on consent uh um, move on to p55 what just happened published in the Tampa times on oh. january 13th 2021 didn't see the consent P55 is PW210010, Oaks Royal 3, huh. paving assessment number 3417 in the amount of $538,777. And the request is to approve. The recommendation is to approve, sorry. Okay. Is anyone here to speak against this item? No one on WebEx for this item, and no emails were submitted for this item. Keox? The Keox for this item. All right, thank you. The uh, let it remain on consent. Next item is P56. Item P56 was published in the Tampa Times on January 13th, 2021. P56 is PW210011, Stagecoach Village, Phase 2, Paving Assessment 3425, in the amount of $332,249. Rec recommendation is approval. Okay. Uh, Anyone here to speak against this item? Here, no one. No one on WebEx. No one. Anyone at the kiosk? No one submitted an email for okay. this item. And no one. Yes, for this item. That's all right. Thank you. All right. I need a motion for uh, P55, 50, oh, wait, P54, 56. Just the consent agenda. <laughs> 54, 55, uh, and 56. Just take a motion. Consent agenda. agenda. I need a motion. Make a motion to consent. Right. A motion and a second by roll call vote. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed 5 0. Next item is P57. Item P57 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on December 16th, 2020. Okay, if you can bring up the PowerPoint on that item, please. While we wait for that to come up, it's uh, P57 is PDD 217506 in the name of Trust Number 7541207, Land Service Corporation Trustee. It's for a change in zoning from AR Agricultural Residential, AC Agricultural, and C2 General Commercial Districts to C2 General Commercial District and I1 Light Industrial Park District. Next slide, please. The parcel is located in north central Pasco County on the northeast corner of the intersection of I-75 and Blanton Road, and it goes up to the, to the um, Hernando County line. Next slide. The site contains approximately 89.07 acres and it's undeveloped. The applicant um, proposes to, the, to develop the southern 14.66 acre portion of the property in conformance with the C2 general commercial district standards for, de for development and the northern 74.41 acre portion of the property in conformance with the I-1 light industrial park district standards for development. The surrounding area is characterized by residential and agricultural pursuits. Following slide, please. The site, the site has a future land use classification of EC currently. However, on December 8, 2020, the Board of County Commissioners adopted a comprehensive plan amendment, CPAL 2006, which amended the future land use on the site from EC Employment Center and AG to IL, Industrial Light, and Com Commercial. If the rezoning is approved, it shall not take effect until such time as the appeal period for the companion CPAL is, has ended. Uh, the applicant held a neighborhood meeting on 225 of 20. Next slide, please. The applicant has agreed to, to uh, voluntarily agree to a deed restriction for the C2 portion of the property that basically limits the permitted uses um, to 140,000 square feet, prohibits multifamily apartments, prohibits auto towing or connected storage of vehicles, prohibits yard trash disposal facilities, 
prohibits construction and demolition debris disposal facilities and prohibits uh, truck spot stops, sorry. And some of the, many of those prohibitions were as a result of comments from the neighborhood meeting. The following slide, please, thank you. The applicant has also volunteered to record a deed restriction over the I-1 portion of the property, which basically limits the uh, I-1 industrial park district permitted uses to not exceed 500,000 square feet, prohibits auto towing and con connected storage of vehicles, prohibits yard trash disposal facilities, prohibits construction demolition debris disposal facilities, and also places a requirement for a 25 foot setback along a parcel that's adjacent to the east, which has a, a single family uh, dwelling on it to remain as a natural undisturbed area, except for the necessity of a fence uh, for maintenance. Next slide. It also um, includes um, uh, specific development standards that are for the property. Uh, which include architectural design of building facades facing 75 shall include windows at ground level and or uh, clerestory and shall not um, or at the clerestory level sorry and shall not include overhead doors it also uh, outside storage of material supplies or products not permitted in the front of any structure when outside storage is exposed to i-75 the area shall be screened at a height of at least one foot higher than the highest material being stored, being screened, not to exceed 10 feet. Additionally, the applicant has included in the deed restriction that loading docks, utility meters, um, HVAC equipment, trash dumpsters, trash compact, compaction, and other service functions are to be incorporated into over, of, to the overall design of the primary building using screening walls of compatible material design and color. Next slide. The next slide uh, shows the current zoning on the property. If you move to the next slide, and this slide actually shows you um, in the uh, purple or lilac area that shows you uh, the area that is proposed for I-1 Light Industrial Park District, and the area that's uh, red with a diagonal line on the bottom on the, on the south end of the property, that's where the, C, the C2 General Commercial District is proposed. Following slide. Following slide shows the uh, future land use. And if you would move on to the next slide, this is the adopted uh, land use based on the comprehensive plan amendment CPAL 2006 on the next slide. The following slide shows the access to the property off of Blanton Road. And um, staff moves to, uh, it's the, this comes to you actually with a recommendation of approval. Um, and it's actually uh, from the Planning and Development Department and the um, uh, Planning Commission. Here for any questions you may have. Okay. Uh, we have anyone to speak to this item? We have no one on yes. WebEx for this item and no emails were submitted for this item. But then you have an applicant. Okay. Is the applicant here? I am here. To yes. Wilhite. Yes. Would you like to speak? Yes. Hi, Barbara Wilhite. For the record, sixty-three twenty-seven Grand Boulevard, Newport Ritchie, Florida, three four six five two. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, this is our fifth public hearing on this item. Um, we've got a unanimous recommendation from Planning Commission, not only on the comp plan that was adopted back in December but also on our rezoning that's before you today and staff is re recommending approval. I don't know if there's anybody at the kiosk um, to speak. Maybe we can check on that. We'd like to reserve any time. I do have my team on the, the, on the line here as well. Larry Guilford is on as well as Mike Razor. Okay. Let's go to the kiosk and see if anyone is at the kiosk to speak against this item. Somebody there. Who's this? Okay. Yes. Hi, this is uh, Attorney Ed Dukowitz. I'm appearing for Cynthia Dukowitz, Marriage 710, Blueberry Hill, Way, Dade City, Florida 33523. And have you been sworn, Mr. Dukowitz? Have you uh, been? Not on this camera. Outside, I raised my hand, but I'll do it again, I swear. Yeah. 
She'll do that right now. Um, uh, we're going to need to get his um, address again for the record. It just came up. We're going to need you to job. state your name and address again because your the voice didn't come through very good. So. Okay, first I'm Edward Dukowitz, D-U-T-K-I-E-W-I-C-Z. I'm appearing for Cynthia Dukowitz, who is one of the property owners of the adjacent land. Her residence is 32710 Blueberry Hill Way, Dade City, Florida, 33523. Thank you, sir. And could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth? So help you God. Thank you. You may proceed. Okay. The request, the request of action should be denied as being inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. There are seven reasons for denied. One, most of the zoning. Two, the zoning is contrary to the intent of the Northeast ASCO overlay. Rezoning is eradicating the agricultural and rural nature of the area. Rezoning allows further commercial development and urban sprawl, which is prohibited by the comprehensive plan. In fact, the county stated in a document submitted that the property which is to the east of the property at issue, which is believed to be owned by the same group that owns the property in question, is intended to be changed to employment center zoning, which will then, if the board follows its course, will be rezoned commercial light of my field, leading to the destruction of the rural nature of the northern area. This application is to include the northeast rural area, and it is the beginning of urban sprawl in this pristine rural area. This is forbidden by the comprehensive plan. Three, the property is specifically zoned employment center. Pasco County, the board, you, in 2019, Gave to the Pasco Economic Development Council, a group of people whose purpose ostensibly is to take money from the taxpayers. 2.9 million taxpayer dollars to attract target industries. It should be noted that target industries specifically those which are slated for its development. The fast food locations anticipated and motel fall far below the targeted income level, and yet both are proposed, and the board is going along with it. The conversion from EC zoning defeats and intentionally wastes the taxpayers' money, which was given to the Pasco EDC for the purpose which will be defeated by this application. Also, parenthetically, the representative of the owners, Ms. Willite, appears to be on the board of directors of the EDC. She appears to be representing both the entity preserve and market the EC zone property and the entity which wants to eliminate the EC zone property. How could such a conflict go unnoticed? Or the light industrial use of fast food restaurants are eyesores placed in public view. Neither provide the higher than average income, which are one of the goals of the EC zone property, and neither is consistent or compatible with the rural character or rural quality of life. Five, commercial zoning is limited in size and the proposed changes exceed the commercial limit. The comp development is limited to 600 by 600 feet along the land road. Six, Strip development is prohibited by the comprehensive plan. See policy FLU 1.62C. By definition, the strip is defined as land which lies alongside a roadway. The industrial strip development lies along I-75. And lastly, seven, the compatibility table plainly states that the zoning changes requested are not compatible with the strong area. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is anyone else at the kiosk? There is no one else at the kiosk. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, Mike. Just, just to, if I'm not correct, for staff and the applicant, if I'm not correct, isn't this site right at the interchange in a long Interstate 75? Yes. Yeah. That's correct. correct. Yeah. Okay, let's make sure. So, so it's at 41 and 75. Yeah. Percent. Yeah. Um, I knew I just kind of wanted to state it for the record, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, we talk about, you know, wanting and needing more industrial, you know, in the county industrial sites. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we're actually losing industrial sites in many instances where people are rezoning from industrial to something that does, is not a job creating site. And this is right on Interstate 75, which is obviously the access you want for tractor trailer trucks um you know ease for the community or people to do business there so to me i mean if anything 
we've seen in a long time, this probably makes more sense because it is at the intersection of 75. So I, yeah, don't know, if the, I don't know if the applicant wants to respond, but I'll, I'll move for approval. Mr. Chairman, why don't we have the applicant? After needs to respond first. So. Yeah. All right, Ms. Briefly, Wilhite. Commissioner. Yeah, br briefly, Commissioner, just for the record. Um, as staff stated, the, the comprehensive plan was amended and you adopted an amendment to IL and COM. The, the zoning categories that are proposed are I1 and C2. There is nothing more clearly consistent than an I1 zoning district with an IL land use and a C2 zoning district with a COM land use. The policies that Mr. Dukowitz uh, Mr. Dukowitz, who's not any type of planning expert, um, although I am, because I just, I wrote most of the comp plan back in 2006, that he, he shares the language from the comp plan, misapplies the language. We're at the rezoning level, and he speaks to policies that deal with the land use amendment level. Now, for example, 1.4.3 and 1.6.3 of, of the future land use element are transitional land use policies that are applied at the comprehensive plan level. He, he cites the policy, the comprehensive plan policy, dealing with commercial 1.6.1 and says we violate that, but that's the very policy that says you can only have C2 zoning in calm land use, and land use if you've adopted a calm land use. So, you know, I've, I've heard his different statements regarding the comprehensive plan, and, you know, they are misinterpreted, they're misapplied. It is property, the former land use was EC, we took away the multifamily component. We kept the commercial component. We kept the light industrial component. We thought the better use of the property was to have no, no residential so we could maximize the use of the property for the employment generating uses. And, um, but Mr. Dirkowitz says that we're not maximizing it for employment gener generating uses. The current zoning is agricultural. So it doesn't have any job producing industrial or commercial jobs where what well, may have agricultural jobs. Certainly not the target job that your that your comp plan has. So with that, um, unless you have any specific questions, we'd ask that you support staff's recommendation. Um, yes, I am on the PDC board. Yes, I'm proud of, of what we brought forward here. We have the support of the Economic Development Council. Um, this is exactly what you want to do in an interchange. And um, we we're happy that we took the multifamily component out because um, we needed to save the property of this interchange for non-residential uses. Okay. Motion and a motion. Yeah, I would have. second um, Commissioner Moore's okay. motion. This is a great I've got place a, for I've investment. got a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, uh, my roll call. Aye. 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 Motion passed 5 0. Okay. Move on to P58. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Amy Heiler here with Long Range Planning. Um, item uh, PDD 210097 is a comprehensive plan text and map amendment uh, in the name of uh, CPAL 2102 Rivers. The proposed amendment is, uh, is proposing uh, to amend the subarea policy flu 7111. Uh, Two rivers and the highway vision plan map 7 36 to update the sub area policies um, and clean up some redundant language. The location is located off of State Road uh, 56 east of Morris Ridge Road and west of Gall Boulevard. And the resolution to this proposal is to provide for a text amendment to the proposed sub or to the sub area policy as well as map 2 or 7 36. Okay. There is also a companion rezoning um, that should be coming or in. To, Excuse me, a companion yeah. rezoning to MPUD that should be coming in shortly. You'll see that. Slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the comprehensive plan, these are the policies that the proposed amendment is consistent with. This is going to be your visual site location, which is located in the South Market area and the urban service area. Slide. 
This is also uh, an aerial identifying the sub area, which is uh, east of Morris Bridge and west of Gull Boulevard. It also abuts Hillsborough County. Your existing zoning is AC Agriculture and AR Agricultural Residential. The applicant, as stated before, is submitting an accompanying MPD to uh, master plan unit development. The existing future land use is PD and there is CON also on site. Um, those are not being changed. And this is the existing highway vision plan map um, that we currently have. And then the next slide will show you what the propose. So what the applicant was proposing was to reclassify Lanier to a residential, um, remove Old Woods Ave, and then uh, we all agreed to place a note on County Line Road. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. This is going to be your final view of what it looks like. And the next slide. So the reason why we are providing a note to uh, County Line Road is this is their um, proposed master plan. The applicant or property owner also owns the subdivision to the south that is in Hillsborough County. And they're proposing to realign the uh, old County Line Road on that property to the south. Um, so basically what's happening is the note on our vision road map is stating that um, if the parallel segment is constructed in Hillsborough County, they're not responsible to do it in Pasco County. If they don't do it in Hillsborough County, then they would be responsible to do it in Pasco County. And next slide. And so this is the transmittal hearing for the amendment. So what we are asking is that you uh, uh, accept or the proposed uh, find the proposed amendment uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan, excuse me, and transmit to the Department of Economic Opportunity um, and other reviewing agencies. The documents that you had just received, just for some clarity on those, um, between the LPA and today's public hearing, we came to an agreement um, with the applicant on their proposed changes to the map, 7-36, uh, and so the new documents, the agenda memo, the updated ordinance, um, and the exhibit that is provided to you reflects those uh, agreed changes. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay. Uh, applicant? Mr. Chair. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is Clark Hobby, Hobby and Hobby PA, 109 North Brush Street, Tampa, Florida, have been sworn. We're in agreement with staff's recommendation. Um, most of the text amendment changes that you see are a reflection of the fact that when the sub area policies were created for two rivers there was not a companion mpud and as i have alerted the board previously uh, we're representing the proposed master developer of the site and there is a pending mpud that will be to you in a matter of a couple of months it was filed some months ago so some of the items that are in the comp plan now, staff acknowledges we can simply move into MPUD conditions. And then there's some other cleanups along the way. Um, as uh, Amy rightly noted, the Thomas family owns the property in Hillsboro and has an approved PD there where the continuation of the intended, intended county line road concept goes. But in working with Mr. Goldstein, we came up with a solution so that we don't have to build basically the same road twice, but that the county can't be put in a position where a full connection is in place if the Hillsborough County uh, project does go. And keeping in mind that you are going to have MPUD conditions and likely a development agreement with the Thomas family and the same entity that owns both parcels that would run with the land. So the county has those assurances. And other than that, we agree with staff's recommendations. We've worked out all the highway vision map issues and are on the same page. And I don't think any neighbors are here to complain. So we're happy to answer any questions. And I've got my co-counsel, Joel, too, on the phone as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is anyone at the, um, key, or not key, but the WebEx? You want no to speak one, to this item? No one's on WebEx. Okay. Is anyone at the kiosk for this item? There is nobody at the kiosk for this item. Okay. 
have no one there. Um, yep. Discussion? Just quick, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to have a discussion with the applicant, and uh, I'm in support of this. We talk about, a, this looks, in the future, it's gonna be a really, really nice, very well done master plan community. This is something that um, has really been on online for a long, long, long time. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's taken everybody a, lot, a long time to get here. Um, and thankfully for the um, Thomas family and um, for helping and, and some of the other people that supported, obviously the expansion of State Road 56, which was something that was very, very much needed here to connect, um, add that connectivity to uh, Zephyr Hills and the rest of the county. And I will say, you know, there is, there are multifamily apartments on this, you know, in the future for this, this property, property, which I understand and I'm in support of because this is an area that does not have the oversaturation of the multifamily. It makes sense in a large master plan community. So I'm, I'm in support and we'll make a motion for approval. I'll second that with this comment. I see the road network, and I know it's way too early to see the trail network, but sure would be nice if trails are just important as the road. So let's see trails on when it comes around, prominently you'll, you'll featured as well. <laughs> when it comes around, they'll listen. Yeah. So, okay. I tried to get that done before they built the road, but the, in the design of the State Road 56 was too far along to pull that trail off right off of 56 and bring it if they Clark knows because we talked about this if we'd been able to get 10 or 15 more feet from the landowners uh -huh. on the side of the multi-use trail that trail could have been a world-class trail uh -huh. but there's still room to fix it all right um I have a I have a motion and a second by roll call vote District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. Aye. Motion passed 5 0. Thank you, Commissioner. Move on, Move on to P59. Item P59 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on December 23rd, 2020. <laughs> so, so what you are receiving right now was by the request of the applicant, they wanted to uh, put this into the record for this item. So uh, item PDD 21-0179 is a large scale comprehensive plan amendment in the name of CPAL 2112 Hay Road. The proposed amendment is uh, proposing to amend the future land use maps, map 2-15 and sheet 21 from Res 6, residential six dwelling units per gross acre, and IL light industrial to Res 24 to allow for the development of 400 apartment units. The location is at the intersection of Wesley Chapel Boulevard and Hay Road, and the resolution is to amend the future land use maps, map 2-15 uh, and sheet 21. There is also a companion rezoning petition for this one. Slide. Uh, the proposed amendment is consistent with the following uh, policies, comprehensive plan policies. Slide. This is your lake locator map. Um, it is in the South Market area as well as the urban service area. Slide. It's located um, off of Wesley Chapel Boulevard with access from Hay Road. Slide. The existing zoning district is AC Agricultural with I-1 Light Industrial. And as stated before, there is a companion MPUD. Slide. The existing future land use is Res 6 and IL. Uh, the proposed amendment to uh, Res 24 would be capped or would permit a maximum density of uh, 400 dwelling units. There are wetland constraints on site as well, um, as and the proposed development will not exceed uh, 13 dwelling units per gross acre. Slide. And this is your visual as to what um, the Res 24 would look like. Slide. The proposed conceptual plan, um, as you can see, it is abutting a multifamily uh, 
area or use. Um, so they will be providing access to the multifamily as well as access to the EC flu. I wish I had the little pointer um, and I should have put an arrow on there. Access is going to be on the left of the screen. Um, access to that site is provided um, to the EC flu that is abutting the property as well. Slide. And with that, we find the BCC um, find that the amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan and authorized transmittal to DEO and other reviewing agencies. Um, there are four additional slides. Those are reserved for the applicant. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. All right. Uh, is the applicant available? Oh, wait. Yes. <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, Joel, too, for the applicant. Yes, sir. Um, Joel to to an associates uh, Palm Harbor, Florida, and I have been sworn. I represent Flournoy Development Company with the consent of the property owners. Uh, there are multiple property owners. This land has been assembled for this potential project. As Amy said, we're on Wesley Chapel Boulevard, west of the I-75 interchange there at 54. Um, this is about 43 acres, gross acres. However, over 16 of those acres are wetlands, uh, many of them class one wetlands. So we actually have 37% of the site uh, that consists of wetlands, which makes this a little bit more of a challenge from the development standpoint and what type of use uh, would be practical. Uh, there are 37 developable acres. As Amy pointed out, uh, we have agreed in a companion MPUD zoning, which is pending to cap the density of 400 units. And if you do that actual math, if you divide the 400 units by 43 gross acres, it's about nine, nine units per acre. If you divide it by the 27 developable acres, it's a little over 14 units per acre. And if you do the somewhat complicated math under your comp plan where you get credit for your developable acres and then a percentage bonus for the wetlands, it does come out to right at 13 units per acre, as Amy indicated. So the practical problem is your comp plan only has a res 12 multifamily category, and then it jumps all the way to res 24. So we can't quite get the density at res 12, hence the reason that it needs to be res 24. But with that said, we've stipulated for the record and the application that we absolutely will cap the density at 400 units in the companion MQD. Uh, we are coming to you with a recommendation from PDD staff and also your planning commission sitting as the local planning agency uh, to approve this plan amendment. And I'd like to point out, and I think this is very important, uh, this is just a transmittal. We understand that there are ongoing questions and discussions about the propriety of more apartment uses uh, in the South Market area, specifically and possibly other areas of the county. We fully understand and respect that this is not an approval. This is just a transmittal to move the process to the state to get any comments they may have. And we recognize and understand that any final approval would and could only occur when this comes back and the board sees both the plan amendment for consideration and also the companion MPUD. So I'm urging all of you respectfully to simply transmit this for us so that at least we aren't held up further if and when the board sees fit for any ultimate approval, which would not be before a May and more likely a June time frame before this could come back. But as to the specific justifications, we are not, I say again, we are not within the designated State Road 54, State Road 56 corridor, which you established by your locational <laughs> resolution last summer. We're, we're not within that, we're outside that. So this is not an area that the board elected to restrict we are within the urban service area. We are within the South Market area. We therefore are entirely consistent with the ULI recommendation that originally served as the basis for your existing comp plan policies, which specifically promote higher multifamily density within the South Market area and this region specifically. Uh, if we could go to my surrounding land use uh, map, um, Amy, if someone can put that up, it was my first my first slide. Thank you. 
Uh, our site is in purple on the graphic before you. Uh, as you can see, it's a north-south, very linear parcel. Uh, to the east of us, the brown area is the existing industrial commerce park, which is largely already developed. So we have industrial commerce immediately to our east. We have the very large employment center, future land use designation to our south and wrapping around to the west, which is in purple. As Amy said, we've committed in the MPUD to provide both a vehicular and a pedestrian cross connect from the southern boundary of our property to and from the employment center. And then immediately contiguous to us on the west side is a project that the board just approved last year. It's the Mattamy Homes townhome project. You approved a multifamily zoning there uh, immediately adjacent to us. So from, so from the traditional comprehensive plan analysis, if there were no other noise or any other concerns, we, we submit that this would be the poster child for an appropriate infill project. Uh, it's the hole in the donut. And because we're adjacent to a large employment center and a commerce center to the east, obviously having multifamily apartments adjacent to that is totally consistent and supportive. For example, in your employment center land use, the board itself established mandatory criteria of 20% land allocation to multifamily use. So, Obviously, multifamily has been deemed critical to supporting employment center and job growth. We can help support that employment center by being contiguous with it and by functionally integrating our project with cross access to and from that future employment center. Um, this, as I said, is a unique narrow parcel. If we can go now, please, to my second side, which is that zoning concept plan. If you look at this, you see substantial wetlands, and most importantly, we have a very large forested wetland on the right-hand side of that screen going all the way out to our frontage on Wesley Chapel Boulevard. In fact, we only have enough upland area to accommodate our access driveway, which will be at that existing signalized intersection on Wesley Chapel. Everything else in the front is a large forested wetland. Uh, it's also a class one wetland, which means there is absolutely no possibility, unlike some other sites that you've looked at recently, there is absolutely no possibility here for future uh, retail or future office employment on that road frontage because nothing can, will ever be constructed there. Uh, so we have substantial setbacks. It's, it's over 850 feet from Wesley Chapel Boulevard to our first um, uh, apartment building that will be more than one story. That first building is a one-story clubhouse and it's over 500 feet itself from the road frontage and you will not even be able to see this project due to that forested wetland uh, in the front. I also point out here that we're being, even though this is the MPD plan, I, I think it's important that you see what we're committing to. That whole perimeter of buildings along our western boundary adjacent to the Mattamy townhome project. Every one of those buildings is restricted in the MPUD to a two-story building only. That two stories will match the two-story townhomes immediately on our western boundary. Um, any buildings above two stories will be on the commerce uh, or industrial park side. So with that said, we did put into the record the market study that you're going to have presented during your work session. I simply wanted to make sure it was part of the formal record here, but I urge you to, to please uh, just transmit the plan amendment so we can get that path going and have this back for your potential consideration in May and June, once you have further vetted uh, the countywide issues that you're discussing about the rental market. Uh, happy to answer any questions, have my client on here as well, and we appreciate your time. Okay. Let me go to uh, WebEx first. Uh, is anyone on WebEx to speak to this item? No one is on WebEx to speak to this item and there was no email submitted for this item. Is anyone at the kiosk for this item? There is nobody at the kiosk for this item. Okay, Commissioner Moore. Oh, so we're back, we're out to the board now, right? Yes. Okay, just to make sure. I, yes, and so I, I was going to refer to this market study. I, I thought it was for this afternoon, but since it was presented during this item, I will refer to it. It's incorrect. Um, 
it states on page one, two, three, I don't know, the back of, let's see here, six, since they presented it now, we got a page 11 and it says, class A apartment communities, map and inventory. I, I can actually, I can actually show you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that aren't even included. So I'll take this and throw it in the little round can next to me. Um, you know, we're, we're going to submit things. Let's be correct when we submit things. Um, second thing is, um, well, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't need to go through what I went through last time, um, referring to the comp plan and the, you know, and everything. There's no need to. And I think Mr. Steinsteiner can attest to that. I mean, the bottom line is this time <clears throat> is now we're taking away light industrial. I'm not going to talk about the past. I'll talk about right now. That's what we need. We talk about it all the time that we need line industrial. I was on a conversation this morning with somebody that has somebody they want to bring into town that's from outside the area that is willing to spend millions and millions of dollars for line industrial land. We keep taking it away. What's our EDC going to do? What's our internal economic development department going to do? They're not going to have anything left. You know, there's got to come, to, it's, you know, we as a board are allowed to say no if we think it's not in the best interest of the community. And over and over again, these are coming in front of us and we're having, I'm hearing yeses. If we get rid of our light industrial land, we're not going to have any left. Right next door, door to this site is Com Park 75. Very, very, very successful project. They've done an extraordinary job. You know, there, there. I'm not saying there could be or would be potential because I'm not in the land buying business. But considering it's contiguous with this site, there's potential there. So that's my again my fear. Listen, nothing. Listen, nothing. Nothing against Mister Two, the applicant, whatever. They're doing their job. I get it. <laughs> At the same time. We as a board, and we talked earlier today about what people in the community think and listening to the community. It's time to do it. It's time to do it. I spend all my time in this district, and we talk about how much we know our districts and the people in the district. Yeah, the one per, well, I don't know how many for sure, but I know one person. I watched the planning commission meeting, which I watched all of them. And there was a nay vote on the planning commission, and it was the person that lives in District 2, because that gentleman knows and hears from the people what's best for that area and what we're losing in the area. So he was, an, he was a nay. But, you know, at some point, what I'm going to ask, and I appreciate it, is if the people that are up here with me, listen to me, because I know what I'm talking about. And our, my people in my community, and I say my community, the, you know, that whole district too, that's where I live. So I hear from them, I see the people all the time. But again, in this instance right here, I'm talking specifically about losing light industrial. We can't lose any more of it. We're not gonna have any left. It was great what happened today, this morning, great project, right? But do we need to rob people to pay Paul? Again, we're gonna have, continue to have people that are gonna bring apartment complexes here on a regular basis. We know that's how it's gonna be. It doesn't mean it's needed. If the Kirby vacuum sales guy comes to my door, he's gonna do his best to sell me that vacuum. I don't need a vacuum, <laughs> but he's gonna try to sell me. We don't need to be sold anymore. Okay. Close the door. Uh, Mr. Moore, I'm gonna give you an example of, of where we do need housing because there are places that do need it because we have been doing a good job of bringing in business. And for an example, Wiregrass, has residential in that area, has, you know, the different shops and the different things to create business. Yep. They have only residentially in that area, they only have, say, 6,000 residential sites, when in actuality they have over 15,000 jobs there. And so it calls for some of these apartments to be near those areas, provide a place for people that work there and live there in our community. So that's a great point, Mr. Chairman. And that's why Wiregrass did a good job. Let me let me continue for a second. Did a great job of adding those products there. 
there are you got to remember how many entitlements are already there. And if you'd like to, I'm happy to provide each and every one of you with it because the entitlements, the amount of entitlements within Wiregrass, the amount of entitlements that are within the Metal Point area that some have been there since 1989. They haven't been built on yet. So what happens then when they're ready to roll? Okay, so. Well, you still got to remember now, everybody can't live in a $500,000 home. Oh, did, did I not just say that there's entitlements for apartments, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. What I told you was there are entitlements for apartments on the Wiregrass property that have not been built. Tons of entitlements. There are tons of entitlements right down the road from the mall you're talking about within the Seven Oaks area. There's a ton of apartment entitlements right down the road in the Metal Point communities. Their entitlements are already there. They're sitting and waiting for them to be built. We're not asking, and I've never asked to take away somebody's entitlements that they already earned and have the zoning they earned. Continue to keep rezoning properties with this oversaturation and doomsday will come. Starkey. Uh, okay, um, is this light industrial or res? Res, like okay, so residential, not yep. So it's both. Um, so the majority of the property is currently res six, um, but there is five acres that are IL. However, um, there's about ninety percent of that five acres that is a Cat One wetland, so it can't be developed on on that Cat One wetland. And then it's also surrounding to the north, um, east, and south is that Cat One wetland going into the um, IL that's adjacent to it. So it, it wouldn't even be able to interact with that IL component because a Cat 1 wetland can't be developed on okay. at all. If you pull, we, pull that map up where mm -hmm. it shows Chairman, that property. I was going to be with Commissioner Moore if this wasn't light industrial because yeah. I don't, that is valuable property that we need to bring. Yeah, but I want you to right see. Right up there. But this is not. See at the bottom of the map. Yeah. I'll look at the left side and see that pond on the yeah. on the bottom. That's that five acre pond. They got rid of Cannot be built on, and that's light industrial zoning. Right. So it's sadly. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Yeah. yeah. We can't hear. You got to be at the mic. You have to be at well, the mic. There's a marked mic right no, there. No, I. Sorry, sorry. I get it. Right there. Yeah. So to right there, yeah. to the south, that's all cat one. So what they're utilizing is whatever space, it's about 10% of that site. They're use, utilizing that for drainage, and then they're gonna have their buffer that they're gonna activate as well as a component or an amenity to their site. So, 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 so for that reason, I'm gonna be in support of this. If, I'm telling you, if this had been industrial, I would not have been support supporting it because Absolutely. I don't wanna be flipping and that, you know, a good site for great jobs. Um, yeah, it's about five acres of the existing 43 acres. So. You know, what's really sad, and it's probably before all of y'all were here, Commissioner Oakley, I don't know if you were paying attention back then, but I think at one time this was the Saddlebrook Corporate Park, a lot of this land. And the owners of this property held it and held it and held it for a long time in hopes that it would be a Class A industrial park, like what, what you see in Raleigh and... And it's such a shame that, you know, the, it was the recession, I guess. And I, I don't remember what precipitated to become housing instead of a really great uh, um, business park. And it was well situated to 75, 54. Could have been, a, you know, could have been another um, Evangeline. But... Um, uh, so I, I will be in support, but um, just throwing this out there to everybody, it, it's not going to, I'm not in favor of swapping IL for yeah. multifamily. Now that IL, for the most case. They, you can't build IL or homes on that property. It's strictly just going to be used for dredging and. That's what their proposed water. proposal is, yes. What is it? Yeah. The majority yeah. of it's a Catwoman Around the wetland. Hill. No. You can't have. build anything in the wetland or around it. So it doesn't matter if it's an IL, Res 6, Res 24, you can't build anything on it anyway. Correct. Because of the wetland, of the wetland part. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Well, I, I don't. This will follow up. And, no, Terry, okay. Well, Terry came up for well, a reason. That's fine. He can wait after <laughs> all this. Thanks. Um, and I appreciate Commissioner Starkey's comments she just made. And I think we need to 
remember to ex we, we extend that we talk about industrial again this is kind of more we'll get into this later but since the comment was made we talk about industrial but let's talk about and this doesn't have doesn't have the zoning so i'm not referring to this property okay I'm not referring to this property at all but we got to think about the commercial and the retail and the office as well when we talk about the rezoning which we'll get into later this afternoon um all right i will yield mr Marion. i don't mean to forget you but do you have something to say to this item yeah i was going to say um you know i i just i think we do have enough apartments out there um it's a big jump in the zoning if they wanted to keep it residential and keep it a smaller densities, I mean, it's it's a tough road to get out on. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of money on that roadway coming up. I don't know how much money we're spending on that, but you probably know. Uh, we got a lot of traffic in that whole area. So do I need more density right there? I don't know if that I do. Well, you got to realize um, the infrastructure we built in that area is, is part of the reason a lot of these things come in that area with the planners because uh, you got to move the traffic and it's there we built the infrastructure to, to serve those people yeah to serve the people it's just part. that are there that can't get out right now sure <laughs> which the truth i mean i don't know why i need to keep, sell people it's, it's, yeah, it's the honest truth right. they keep coming i'm place. gonna invite everybody in a bus ride one down one day down there seriously yep. um, you need to see it does Spend some time there do we don't have to vote on this at all do we this is the vote for the transmittal. Oh, we do have to? Okay. And this is the second phase of the comp plan, so it's being transmitted to DEO. All right. Then I'll need a motion. Uh, move to approve. You, move staff recommendation. What? Is that? Yeah, move that, staff recommendation. And the staff recommendation is to, to transmit to, it to DEO. I second. Okay. Um, I got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye by roll call vote. <laughs> <laughs> that was slick. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District four, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District five, Commissioner Mariano. Nay. District one, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed three to two. Okay, ready. I think it's getting to be that time. All right, we go on to where are we at here? That's your workshop. Yeah, I gotta go to R52, yeah, R52 is the right number. And we have Mr. Pitos here in front of us. Yes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this item is for the multifamily discussion that's on the regular agenda for the Board of County Commissioners today. Um, what I'll go ahead and do is a brief overview of the locational criteria uh, background. A summary of information that's been presented by the Planning and Development Department and the Board of County Commissioners in brief uh, today. We'll go through some current issues and concerns. Uh, what questions and data still remain to be understood and uh, effectively asked what is the what is the main issue here yeah. and then also review some of the options for consideration that the board may uh, may look into next slide please. yes thank you um, so on the overhead here we have a summary of background in terms of some of the locational criteria uh, this comes from the ULI report that's often cited to the Board of County Commissioners regarding this subject on multifamily land use. Um, and then in 2008, the ULI report recommended to divide the county into five sub areas, each with its own vision and strategies. Uh, it also recommended that we revise the comprehensive plan with focus on infrastructure improvements and specific growth nodes or, or specific locations within the county. 
Um, it uh, identified a demand over 20 years for residential pro projects to be the largest in the south area of the county, what would eventually become known in the comprehensive plan as the south market area. And then, of course, the ULI report identified that and said ought to promote higher density, more compact development to take advantage of, of transit opportunities by encouraging vertical uh, development, cluster development, and such. And to concentrate those uses uh, to allow the preservation enhancement of the natural systems that exist. The South Market area does have quite a bit of open space in terms of wetlands and what have you. Uh, and also to designate an urban service area. So that, those are some of the findings that were identified in the ULI report. Next slide. Um, this map you've seen a number of times, uh, beginning with the workshop that was in February of 2020. This is essentially uh, identifying where the different types of residential products exist. So the, the, the light yellowish color that's on the map uh, illustrates where single family residential districts are uh, primarily located. Uh, and then some of the, the red colors that are on the map illustrate uh, MPUDs, master plan unit developments, and those which have residential within them. And we've broken it down on the map there for the dark burgundy ones to illustrate where MPUDs that are only about multifamily. Uh, the pink ones illustrate multifamily is allowed within the MPUDs, and the dark or the deep red is uh, multifamily residential districts proper, such as MF1s and what have you. Um, and if you recall at the January 12 BCC meeting, we dove into the area that's specifically located around State Road 54, 56, and I-75 that shows up on this map as the Burgundy MPUDs. Uh, next slide, please. This map is illustrating the extent of the urban service area. Uh, and it's also identifying uh, a number of zoning uh, districts. I think it's the C2 zoning district on this, on this particular map, uh, so that you have an idea for where some of the, those uh, C2 uses, or rather zoning districts are. Uh, which do allow for multifamily via conditional use if you're in the right uh, future land use category. But in That's general, what the this, red is? pardon me? That's what the red is because there's no. Yeah, it, the key got cut off at the bottom there. Okay. Um, but this is the urban service area, and that's the point of this slide. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of the locational criteria that the ULI report in 2013 identified, it continued to, to ask for focus, focusing growth on major corridors to enhance opportunities for connectivity, transit, and placemaking. Um, they encouraged transit development as a trip reduction measure, consolidate employment zones to avoid sprawl and enhance transit, uh, diverse uh, through various policies, create diverse shopping and entertainment uses focused around those transit stops, higher density residential located on retail and walkable to transit to eliminate car trips and, and dispersed growth patterns are expensive to serve and will further proliferate sprawl. And I guess that was the concluding statement to bring all of the other bullets on top of that together. On the map, you can kind of see why the South Market area was identified as a, as a focal point in, in, in the county both in terms of the previous map that showed the urban service area, but then also just from a transportation uh, perspective, the type of east-west access that it can provide to the entire region, as well as uh, circulation to and from uh, our neighbors to the south in Hillsborough County and in uh, Pinal Pinalas County. And uh, key things to note there, the two, uh, go back one slide, sorry. There you go. Uh, the two arrows going to the north, of course, is the Suncoast Parkway and, and I-75 corridors. Uh, and the fact that 5456 is one of the main links between these two uh, expressway systems uh, in the region. Next slide. Uh, in addition to what the ULI found, uh, T-BARDA has been working on a regional uh, project, a regional rapid transit system that will essentially take you from downtown St. Petersburg all the way up into, Wes into the Wesley Chapel area at State Road 54 and I-75 <coughs> with, with another stop potentially at State Road 56 and I-75. So two RRT stops within uh, Pasco County that service the entire region. 
Uh, and this is uh, to be uh, considered in line with some of the ULI recommendations and what our comprehensive plan is uh, reflecting uh, for uh, locating populations nearest to transit areas uh, so that they can access um, major interregional infrastructure such as I-75 and the regional rapid transit system. Next slide. Uh, and this is a, this kind of zooms in. Uh, Tibarda has an ongoing planning effort. This this has been one of their um, target areas to put a station. Um, and one of the the data for consideration in determining a location for a rapid transit station is land use, population density, which is the subject at hand today, jobs and affordable housing, the riders having the number of commuters uh, that can. Uh, go to the station and then also travel away from the station once they arrive in Pasco County. Uh, and then also what kind of multimodal connectivity is there within half a mile of the potential location of that station. Uh, so in terms of sidewalk infrastructure, bicycle facilities um, and, and, and other modes. Again, going to the uh, speaking to the concept of locating population uh, nearest to infrastructure. Next slide. So uh, without going into all the things that we talked about at a previous BCC meeting and at the workshop, um, we have discussed where multifamily units can be built uh, and how many have been built. Um, and I noted in a, in a previous um, meeting, 26% of the county is uh, res six and 27% is res nine. And we talked about how the residential flus can often cap uh, zoning density, prescribed zoning densities. 0.63% um, of the acres in the county are zoned multifamily. Approximately 0.17 acres are of single family for every one acre of multifamily. Um, the highlighted portion of the slide illustrates new information that hasn't been presented before. There was a question previously in terms of how many multifamily units have been, how, how many permits have been pulled for new multifamily since the February 2019 workshop. So we, um, excuse me, the February 2020 workshop. So we, we looked at January 2019 to January 2021, and we uh, found that there were 412 multifamily units where permits were pulled. In the same time frame, about 4,481 single family units detached uh, were, were pulled in that, in that period. We also discussed options for addressing multifamily at at previous uh, board meetings, multi mobility fees um, were updated and we've completed that. That was uh, with regard to affordable housing, but then also for removing the incentive on multifamily in the mobility fee tables. Um, a policy directive was crafted by the Board of County Commission, Commissioners and issued in the uh, summer of 2020. Uh, and then there's been a zoning district update, which has been initiated um, in terms of the Land development code rewrite activities. Mr. Chairman, can I ask you a question? Uh, yes. So I disagree with what I don't know where you're getting this from. Um, this January 19 of 2021. And I'll say this, Terry, because when you the information you provided to Andy and I last year, you guys didn't even have all the apartment complexes in this area. We had to find a bunch of them. So that was incorrect. Sorry, but it's, I'm right. Um, this 412. Um, so let me ask you the, the new one that was built in front of recently in front of Lexington Oaks, let's embed the math, it's probably been about almost a year now, that can still has signs out front that says, you know, rentals available. How many units does that have? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. But the, this information was uh, coming out of the, the Acelo system. It's, it's, yeah, it's well, based on, it's not it's, particular to any one development, it's across the, the yeah, county. You guys had a, and I'm not correct, I'll bring Andy up here in a second, um, you guys can't find all that information on Acela. That was told to me. You guys don't have the ability to find all that information on Acela. The, the number of permits and the, the number. Yeah, of, you guys are having difficulty finding that information. Well, the, you guys couldn't even find. You guys couldn't even find all the information for the apartment complexes. Well, am I not right? Well, Andy, we can't I'm gonna let Andy tell you because he went through this with me. Well, we can, if I may. Well, why didn't you? If I may. Wait, wait, you you've asked a lot of questions well, and he hasn't been able to answer yeah. one. So, so let I, I need to hear answers. It, it, well, it we, does we, seem low to me. You're saying only 412 rental units 
have been per permitted in the permits, last two years? Permits pulled. Permits pulled. Permits pulled. So some of the ones that have been built on 54 were pulled prior to this. So this is just in this window and That's we charge it? mobility fee by unit, which means we would be able to know the number of units on in each in each yeah. complex. So is that in a certain area? Is this in the urban service area? I think this is, uh, well, most of it, it's, it's in the urban service area, but it's basically an across the county number. So like the, the I think there's some coming up in front of Long Lake Ranch. Were those then pulled before 2019? You know, Long Lake. Yeah, uh, Sun Lake and 54. There's a lot of construction going on. I'm not there. sure they pulled. They may not pull the building permits for those yet. They're doing the site work there. Okay, I don't know. Yeah. So there, are there are some across. The there are some across the street that would have been pulled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In so the distinction is in a cellar. If there's a permit, you can pull the information related to a, a specific permit. What is difficult to get in a, through a cellar and to download from a cellar is the proposed number or projected number of multifamily units that could be built because in that scenario, we actually have to go into each and every MPUD, download the site planning efforts that have occurred and basically digest what is the potential for multifamily that's happened, that, that could happen. That's what can't be pulled from a seller. A seller won't give us raw data on that. You have to actually go into the site plan and begin to interpret the site plan to discover you know, what the potential might, might be. But when you're when you're pulling a permit, it's a direct one-to-one -one, uh, transaction happening there. And so from that information, you can pull it. That data uh, exists in another department. And that data exists from the building construction services department. Mr. Chairman, Jack Mario. Yeah, well, Charleston at Wesley Chapel alone has that's being has 228 units. This is not right. Any close. Charleston. Mr. Chairman, Jack Mariano. Double, double check that number. It's not Mr. Mariano. Yes. Um, I think clearly uh, we have a disconnect as far as what information is 100% valid. Um, because if you look at the number of apartments that have been built, that those numbers aren't giving us a clear picture. Um, as Commissioner Moore mentioned earlier in the previous public hearing we had, We've got DRIs that have all these permitted apartment complexes coming that will be coming in that it doesn't seem to me that you're accounting for whatsoever. So we've got to get a better accounting total to find out what potentially could happen. Because the densities that we set years ago were designed to be what we would, didn't have to do these rezonings, you know, one by one by one. So I think we need to do a really thorough intensive accounting as far as what's out there that can be built, not just what these permits that you're showing right here. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, and I don't want to keep interrupting, but no, you know, Aiken has 252. So right there, I'm at 275 or uh, 475 for two, pro just two projects. They may have pulled their permits. Yeah, but their permits might have been pulled before that. I, mm, I don't see how the. Uh, well, they sit on okay. there for a while. They have to go get there. I, all right, Jerry, we, we can definitely look into the numbers, but the, the, now, that's, you know. Okay, so. The, uh, the intent was to illustrate the activity that's happening in one year's time. Right. Since the 2020 workshop. Well, uh -huh. isn't that two years time? Yeah, exactly. Is that a mistake there? Should that uh, be January, January 2020? 2020. January 2020, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. There's yeah. a typo there. And Mr. Chairman, just follow up. Okay. The, the um, Aiken is the one at Twin Lakes which you guys just approved like about a year ago. Um, so that permit had to be pulled and that one's, that one's uh, 252 alone. I think he's made yeah, a mistake here. He just if, said if, that's if 2019 they, to 2020. Yet. If they're doing site work, they haven't pulled the building they permit, the building yet. permit and it wouldn't be counted yet. If they're building the buildings. Then they're going vertical, then they're that vertical, would, yeah. but if this was the, the calendar year 2019, then it wouldn't be in that. Then we go, use, that's a one year snapshot. 19 to so you're saying this is 19 to 20 not 19 to 20. I think what? that's what I heard. That's what I heard too. Okay. I'm confirming. That's a little more positive. Okay. <laughs> not two years. Okay. I, not even that. But. Okay. Let's let him finish this. We we'll, have we'll, we'll circle back on the on the actual date. 
Um, next slide, please. In terms of the mobility fee update, a quick summary of that. Um, multifamily and the mobility fee tables that will not have an increase to the net fee would be the low rise condominium townhouse, the high rise condominium, uh, three or more stories, age restricted multifamily, and congregate care facilities. So condos, townhouses, age restricted multifamily, and congregate care. Multifamily apartments in Mudder MTND or TOD will also not have an increase to the net fee only in the, only those in the standard category across urban, suburban, and rural. Meaning that when the fee was eliminated, they were those that find themselves within Mudder MTND and TOD will still have an incentive. And at the time, the board um, found that to be consistent with the intent, which is to make a, a trip reduction community out of Mudder MTND and TOD. Next slide, please. Um, this is a quick summary of the multifamily policy directive that was uh, approved over the summer. It illustrates the State Road 54 and State Road 56 corridor from Gun Highway to US 301. Right. I won't go into all of that. I think that's um, everyone is familiar with it. Uh, the main idea being that if you're within 2,000 feet of this corridor, um, multifamily ought, must locate uh, to, the, to the rear of the corridor, enabling a viable commercial and slash non-residential frontage for employment generating uses um, along the corridor itself. Next slide, please. Uh, we also discussed affordable housing needs for Pasco County for citizens um, at the board workshop back in February. So 40% of the Pasco households have incomes under 80% of the AMI and qualifies low moderate income households. And 54% of Pasco County yes. residents are cost burdened and pay more than 30% of their uh, household we'll income right on housing. The largest housing needs are for own, owners and renters below 60%. And that was just uh, framing some of the uh, multi, some of the multifamily discussion um, at the time back in February. And, and I want to say to me, um, as I'm learning more and more, this, this is so important to the stability of communities. I, um, I, it used to be that DRIs had a, um, affordable housing component to them. I don't, I think it was 10%. Do you, do you remember what it was, Terry? Were you, were you here in Florida when we had DRIs? I was not, no. Okay, it was 10%. So 10% of any DRI had to have workforce housing kind of um, um, built into it. And we got away from that. And so now, now it's a problem. You don't want your, people don't want to have to drive far away um, from where they can afford to live to get to their job. And I think we have a responsibility to make sure that within any amount of distance, certain amount of distance, and I don't know what that number is, but a certain amount of distance from any employment center or you know lar large employment area, we need to have some workforce housing. Um, because I, you, know, you know, down in Monroe County, the teachers and the policemen and, and uh, the, the, the um, service industry people live in Miami-Dade and they take them down there in buses. What kind of quality of life is that? Because they can't afford to live there. So I'm, I am really getting concerned that we don't pay enough attention to this part of our society and they need to be integrated into all our communities. Some of the multifamily we're looking at is unaffordable for the people that you're talking about. Oh, a class A apartment, They're that is high. not workforce. These housing. are 1450 yeah. for yeah. a single bedroom. So yeah. they, they can't afford some of that. That's a different animal. And, and yeah. um, I just actually was on a, well, we'll, we'll talk, I hope we have a workshop on this sometime because I want to talk about land trusts and other things that we can do to help that. Okay. Well, Mr. All right, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just to respond to the statement you just made, and you made a good statement because you made a statement earlier in the last hearing, which I didn't appreciate, by the way, but no, I'm being serious. You just stated, you contradicted your own statement from earlier, people can't afford those $1,500 a month apartments. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree. Four so, percent of our citizens. And that's in your yes. So you're saying so going back to the point of having too many of those, not having enough of the other housing, that's 
You're exactly right. <laughs> All right, so Terry. In the All right, go ahead, Terry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then some of the perceived issues with multifamily that have been noted in the, in the past, higher density development of burdens, public schools and other services, um, based on the research that we've been able to look at, there are fewer families with children that live in apartments uh, and put less demand on schools and sing than single family homes. This does play out um, in some of the things that we look at when we do uh, the analysis for with uh, Pasco County Schools, and they provide their comments to us with regard to comprehensive plan amendments and whatnot. Um, the compact nature of development requires less infrastructure. Uh, it's less land, so uh, you're making use of no, existing sure. infrastructure as much as as much as possible. You don't have to build as much to reach everything. Uh, introducing higher density projects can actually increase the community's revenue and help pay for schools for students in low density for students that live in low density developments. Um, Next slide. I have a question. Yes. Now, does that hold true in class A apartments compared to regular apartments? Since my question, I guess, is you're saying that there are less kids that live in apartment complexes. Is that only for class A apartment complexes? Because on the 19,000 apartments that we have on the west side of Pasco, I can name numerous apartment complex that have probably hundreds of kids in those apartments. Yeah, I think it's a, um, a statistic that really doesn't mention income level or the type of apartment, whether it's class A or class B or what have you. I think it's an across the board. Is there a way to find that out? Because it sounds like they would be skewed if it's affordable housing. And I feel that you would have a lot more children in that area compared to a class A apartment. Um, I'm because sure class we can look they at the data. probably want to live in Generally nice speaking, when, when, the, when the national studies uh, put this information out, they're usually averaging the situation. Um, uh, to a large extent, you know, the number of rooms in, in a unit influences family size, or rather family sizes look for a certain number of unit rooms to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and apartments tend to be limited to two and three bedrooms um, on the upper end. Um, so that helps to uh, the marketplace sort, of sort itself out in terms of who's locating where and in what kind of units. And I think they limit the number of people in a bedroom. Yes, many many apartment complexes do have limits in terms of the number of people per bedroom. Well. well, you have the one apartment complex that has five, their five bedroom apartments. Those are unusual. Those ones on Rowan, mm -hmm. 54, yeah. That was built for congregate living. And right, down. and now it ends up turned into Section 8 housing as well, so in affordable housing. I, Commissioner, I think we also have data from the school district that went into their fee, their impact fee that demonstrates multifamily. We charge significantly less in the single family when it comes to school impacts, and, and that would be from Pasco County's own data, school districts. So the concern is, and I don't know if it's now or later that I should be mentioning this, the concern is it's great that we have all these class A apartments now. What's going to happen in 30 years from now? Because we have 19,000 apartments on the west side, about 12,000 in the north. I think you said eight or 9,000 in the south and about 1,000 on the east. So it's great that we have all of these apartments. But when you sit back and you look at the list of the class A apartments, we've got two on the west side along 19 one in seven springs and then everything else is along 54 and 56 so you really don't have many class a apartments on the west side of Pasco county but you have more than about 50 percent of the apartments on the west side of Pasco county i i think that mr chairman i think that there there will be a representative who can speak to the market uh, more clearly than i can speak so, so we really we have, probably we need to be speakers speak. yeah so I, i'm not discounting the questions commissioner it's just I, I'm probably not the market expert to be able to answer you the, precisely with regard to your questions, but there is somebody who, who may be able to answer them. Uh -huh. I'm just trying to figure out for in 30 years from now, are we going to end up in the same situation with all these additional overcrowded or undercrowded apartments that turn into affordable housing? And how we can help now to 
and I have a list of the apartment complexes and the crime rates for each individual apartment on the in the county. So I'm trying to look into that as well. Um, it, I'll quickly run through these slides so that I can finish my presentation and let the market uh, analysts speak to the market itself. So in terms of higher density developments, um, they're perceived as having lower property values, but uh, national research indicates that there's no real discernible difference uh, between developments at times. They show higher property value in cases of, of mixed use um, densities. Also, higher density creates more traffic and parking problems. The national studies indicate that higher density developments generate less traffic than low density um, development, making walking and public transit more feasible and, and more to the point of what the, what where multifamily is trying to locate around the infrastructure that exists. Uh, according to data from the National Personal Transportation Survey, doubling density decreases the vehicle miles traveled by 38%. And I think the, the final statistic on the slide here is kind of important. The trip generation, the 10th edition of the ITE manual shows um, 9.4 daily trips for single family detached versus 7.3 uh, daily trips for multifamily. Um, so next slide. Um, another perceived issue with multifamily is that higher density leads to higher crime. It's not significantly different based on the national studies that, that we've been looking at, um, especially if the multifamily is designed with eyes on the street, then there, there's in, increased pedestrian activity, crime may actually be reduced. Um, in terms of higher density, a perceived issue being higher density development is environmentally more destructive than lower density. It's actually National studies are indicating that lower density development consumes more land uh, for development because they have to sprawl out further due to the lower density. So it has, has a much more a larger footprint in that sense. Um, and then another perceived issue is that higher density housing is only for lower income households. Um, there is a rise and trend of apartment dwellers being higher income brackets, which I think the um, market analysts will be able to speak to um, more definitively than I can. Mr. Chairman, um, sorry. Of the remaining... Mr. What? Chairman? Yes, sir. Mr. Mario. So looking at that data, um, you know, we had Daryl LeClaire who built the Carillon Parkway, uh, invited the Pasco EDC down here about 10 years ago to go take a look at what he had done for uh, constructing job development. And when he brought us down there, he then talked about Pasco County a little bit. And he said, you know, the problem with Pasco is you've got a great asset that you don't even capitalize on. And he was talking about US-19. He says, your elevations for building stuff two and three stories high, you don't get the densities you want, so people don't get the views you want to get a better building that's built. Now, Terry, for you to say that a I have a report saying the higher density housing is only for lower income households, but you get a, a conflict to that. I'm going to tell you, if you go look at the west side of Pasco, go look at the apartments that were built, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and tell me that it doesn't, it's not affected with lower income compared to higher income in other places. Uh, it's a big difference. As a matter of fact, on the west side, as far as affordable housing goes, I think part of the reason we're struggling on the west side is you had all these people that were retirees built in two bedroom, two bath homes, sometimes three bedroom, two bath homes on the west side. And as they retired, uh, as they passed on and, the, and, and more, more people came in and the rental market got up, everything in that whole area has gone down demographically. That's why you've seen everything moved elsewhere out, out of there because the demographics don't support. So, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to push this apartment thing as not being a demographically challenged project or a situation, and I, and I think it is. I think home ownership is a much better way to go, whether it be townhome, whether it be a condominium, or, with, or just single family homes than compared to apartments. And to try to push that off another way as a demographic that's equal, I, I don't think is uh, forthright. So well, can I, I jump in on this? Go ahead. We, I mean, only three o'clock. We have hours still. Uh, so um, I want to take downtown Newport Ritchie for an example. Downtown Newport Ritchie struggled and struggled and struggled to be successful because it did not have density. 
and it was the introduction of the two apartment complexes, one um, that a commissioner family member lives in, and one that my brother-in-law built um, downtown that is really helping to revitalize that downtown corridor, and they need more apartments down there and more density, and frankly, it needs to be a mix of the uh, rental, the, the apartments, because young professionals aren't buying anything. They want to rent. Um, and then they need um, townhomes. But the, but the success of downtown Newport Ritchie is going to be finding ways to have density in a close, walkable proximity to those shops or a close golf court proximity. So, um, I, so what he's saying on the left is that that's what people seem to think, but what is actually happening is what's on the right. And sometimes people don't really know what the classic defini definition of sprawl is. And are you going to get into that in here? Because you've mentioned it, but I'm not sure you've defined it. Uh, I was not planning on getting into the definition of sprawl. Um, but what I'm, what I'm illustrating on these slides is not that I'm trying to push an agenda. Yeah. Uh, it is merely to illustrate what common um, ideas exist about multifamily and what national research is showing to us. Right. Um, so that, that's all that I'm trying to do here. There's a, there's a perception about higher density housing being only for low income households. Um, and we, we've looked at reports um, in multiple studies that indicate that uh, it's not only for low income housing. Certainly there is low income housing that is apartment um, and there could be quite a bit of it. Um, but I think there's a, there are demographic changes that are occurring within uh, the country, within the state, within this region even, um, that are moving toward apartment dwelling, no matter the income bracket. Right. Um, and that's all that I'm, I'm trying to illustrate with this slide here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, some of the remaining questions that were uh, asked at the previous at a previous board meeting was that how much multifamily is needed in a community, and what is the right balance between single family and multifamily as land uses? And on the right side, I have what we think might be able to get us closer to understanding those questions. Um, you know, residential densities and mixtures of residential uses is not a one size fits all approach, and we have to be able to understand the residential market. Uh, in order to understand the fiscal impact associated with these types of land uses. Um, understanding that aspect of the marketplace uh, will enable us to have a better understanding of uh, what kind of densities are necessary to support transit functions, and not just transit, but all types of infrastructure, the type of you know, water mains that might be needed, utility lines, et cetera. It's all, it's all part of that urban service infrastructure um, that, that we often talk about in urban planning. And then also, you know, once you've been able to determine that, uh, what is the need in the marketplace? What is the need to support that need? Um, then you can come back and start filling in and understand what kind of diversity of land uses are necessary beyond single family detached uh, to create a balanced approach, a fiscally balanced approach uh, for creating thriving communities. Um, next slide. Should I fire Adam? Yeah. Terry, let me ask you a question because I just I just wanted to look up the definition of apartment because I know in the cities they they people can own apartments up there. Down here we don't consider that people own them. Usually they're just going to be renting them. So an apartment can't be like a condo. The Harvard report data, does that show that it's all rental or is it a combination of ownership as well, like a condo? Yeah, the, the Harvard report looked at um I'm trying to remember this. It was a combination. Um, it, it was essentially looking the subject, looking at the subject of multifamily across the board. So it was looking at uh, condominiums. It was looking at apartments. It did look at townhomes. Um, there were portions of the report that's that focused on rental specifically. Yes. Um, in general, there's a. I think we all know that there's a distinction between rental. Uh, the rental market and the market that is seeking to to uh, own a home, uh, own a property. So the Harvard report was kind of looking at it across the board. So, so I, I gather that you're really kind of muddying the waters between a rental market 
and then a multifamily market because they are significantly different, as you've just stated. And the way you're well, using your data using is one source that's taken both of those together and you're really kind of highlighting, I think you're putting them in a better light than what they really are. The, well, in general, people take, and our code is no exception, our comprehensive plan is not an exception to this either, but what anything greater than a single family detached unit is essentially lumped together in, in a category known as multifamily. So it could be a single family attached row house or townhouse or duplex or whatever it might be called. Although ramp it up all the way to a 28 story sky rise and uh, the apartments that are, or condos that are in such a building. And it's all kind of classified together um, in the category of multifamily. Um, so I'm not trying to muddy the waters, but um, the subject is a little difficult to parse. And it's, it's, it's not an isolated matter to PASCO. This is something that happens across the country in, in terms of how people view things beyond single family detached. Um, but I understand it's a difficult subject and, and parsing it is, there's a task to be done there. Um, and, and, and we have suggested in previous workshops too that really we, need, we think that it may be better to start looking at a, um, a typology of land uses in terms of how multifamily shows up in the community um, so that you don't have something that goes from single family detached straight to apartment buildings. You have the, the middle range of housing that exists and where do those densities go and how do they look, right? We, we've talked about that as, a, as, a, as one way that we may be able to sort of untangle the multifamily knot. But, that, but that's for a deeper discussion potentially in the future. Um, well, I'm gonna say as far as a discussion for the future, the future is now. And if we're gonna talk about multifamily, the type of ownership is part of multifamily I think should be separated. Because if I'm gonna consider the apartments along Ridge Road compared to Miami uh, condominiums up, up and down that are multi-stories high, there's a big difference between the two, but you're kind of treating them the same. And I think it's something that, you know, if we, if we haven't separated our code out the way others have, whether it be in the Northeast or even South Miami, then maybe we need to go take a look at that as being a separate thing, which we can look at to find out, okay, what fits where, and how do you want to go about it? Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Yes, sir. The problem is that from a land use standpoint and from the planning director's standpoint in this presentation, there shouldn't be a distinction about ownership. I have said that to the board on numerous occasions. If you are talking about land use, ownership has no business in the conversation. Okay. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, yes, sir. To, to address the future being now, um, there are some options to consider. Um, up, um, updating the comprehensive plan, doing full amendments, and calibrating the comprehensive plan is one option to look at the land use itself. The good news on that front is that the comprehensive plan update is actually commencing this month, actually tomorrow, Wednesday, is the kickoff meeting on that. Um, so there is going to be an effort that's, that's going to be underway. Um, land development code design and development standards and, and updates to that um, portion of our regulatory environment, that's uh, tentative uh, to, our, to spring of uh, 2022. Um, but the chapter 500 phase two is actually beginning as soon as phase one is complete. And we are nearing completion of phase one where we are anticipating bringing phase one to the board uh, probably in the April timeframe of this year. So phase two will likely begin as soon as um, phase one is approved by the, by the Board of County Commissioners, um, potentially probably May, June of this year. Uh -huh. um, in addition, some other options for consideration that had, um, and th this has kind of been talked about in other parts of the region, which we'll get to. There's an, I, there are, uh, an option of moratorium, but it has to be contingent upon identification of a problem in order to make sure it is not arbitrary and discriminatory. Um, it, um, one might consider it to be in a limited geography or, or countywide, 
uh, for the purpose of conducting market analyses, etc., uh, determining the types of multifamily that are needed. Uh, and then finally, there's also the status quo, which would be a project by project uh, review of where multifamily is locating. Um, next slide. And I just wanted to conclude and, and show this last slide to give an idea of some of the things that are happening in other parts of our region, as well as the country itself. Um, Newport Ritchie uh, has a six month uh, moratorium to ensure compatibility with surrounding uh, with the surrounding uh, built environment and staff is creating design elements and, and construction standards associated with that land use. Um, it's applicable to multifamily of four or more units. Uh, as a by way of example, on the other side of the country, Spokane Valley, Washington uh, has a moratorium right now on on PUDs with multifamily. Um, more closer to home again in Claremont, Florida, there's a nine month moratorium on new apartments. And in that case, there's uh, to ensure more workforce housing and to enhance standards, locations, affordability with the goal to lift restrictions of multifamily in certain areas to support more sustainable walkable areas. Um, and then, of course, they're taking a look at, you know, what type of bonus credits can be included if workforce housing is, is part of their project. Then back across the other end of the country in, in Bellingham, Washington, there's a one year moratorium on multifamily outside of the multifamily zones in their community. Um, and this, they're doing this to review and create changes to the zoning to correct the pattern of underdeveloped parcels with de less density than the comprehensive plan intended. Um, and then again, really close to home again is um, the current conversation that's happening in the city of Tampa, um, which we're currently watching right now, and they have not yet come to a conclusion to determine whether or not they'll actually do a moratorium and what their rationale for that moratorium uh, would be. So kind of going back to the previous slide for a second, um, that that about rounds out what some of what some options there what some options for consideration there there could be for the for the board to to look into. Um, I believe that completes my presentation. I know that there's other speakers, so I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to yield my floor. Okay, we'll come back to you if we have some questions and um, make sure we get everybody that the speakers so they can have their time. Uh, this time, Mark McBride. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, great. Thank you. Well, um, I just I've lived here in, for 12 years and you know, I've been very involved in our community. I've uh, lived in two separate subdivisions, been involved with various school rezoning issues, moderate a very active and large social media group, and I'm also on the Homeowners Association board. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about these apartments. Um, because there are some misperceptions out there, I think, on our communities and what we feel about apartments. First of all, we're not anti-apartments. We just don't want oversaturation of apartments. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion here on what that means um, and the number of single-family homes and how they utilize schools. But I can tell you, office space and commercial space do not use the schools. In fact, they help fund the schools. And they also help sponsor athletic events. And so when we shift these things away, we are creating an increased demand on our school district. And I know it was brought up at one of the last meetings that, um, you know, some of these apartments is only going to put the school at 110% capacity or 101% capacity. And we have portables for kids. But, you know, I'm a parent and my son was in a portable for three years. And it's appalling. It's third world country classrooms. We can do better than that. If I realize the school district had no choice at the time, but we don't want to go back to our kids being in portables. And so we're at 101% capacity now. Then what happens when you have the land that's already zoned for apartments and they decide to build those apartments, this is going to creep up real fast. And then you're going to have the other developers that say, hey, I want this change. Do let them change. I'm going to sue you if you don't allow me to change. And, and this, we're going down a slippery slope. You know, there's another misperception out there that we all live in $500,000 homes. And that's simply not the case, at least in the greater Western Chapel area. You know, being involved with the school rezoning, 
I received a lot of data and I just looked up some data. 26.6% of the students at Wiregrass Ranch High School are on free or reduced lunches. 29.7 at John Long Middle School are on free or reduced lunches. So this isn't a statement about economics. This isn't a statement that we're all privileged people that don't want to allow people to infiltrate our community. That's wrong. We respect the diversity. We respect the communities that we have. We're just concerned that you are changing the footprint of our community. And it's this is going to have grave consequences for generations to come. When I first was married 27 years ago, I lived in a community that made these, the same mistake we're about to make here. They allowed rezoning of apartments. They built luxury apartments. It was great. Things were great for the first decade. Then all of a sudden, people decided to move on to the latest and greatest. These luxury apartments became capital star. People, they didn't reinvest. The regular apartments had to cut their rates so low that they became mecca for drug activity. And it became such a strain on the city that the city spent millions of dollars buying apartment complexes to convert them to office and commercial use. We're making a mistake that's going to last a lifetime. And we, we have to be very, very cautious. Again, we have land that is zoned for apartments. In some of these requests, it's literally just over a thousand feet away. And yet we're going to change a footprint for something instead of say, go buy that parcel that's already zoned for apartments. And, and that's really what we're concerned about. You know, Pasco County's open spaces, vibrant places. Eventually, the space is going to run out, and are we going to be left with a vibrant community? That is the question. And so, I just really ask that you take a hard look at this because the consequences are irreversible. And you know, when you look at what the what the trend is in other cities, they're putting moratoriums on this, and here we're just handing out meal tickets. Remember, the developers' main goal is to make money. And that is why they're doing this. They're certainly not doing this because they want to better or enrich in our community. We're the ones that are left here living it. And, you know, I can tell you with working in these school rezoning cases that whenever these rezoning cases come up, people blame the county commissioners every single time. They keep approving these. And I, we're at a point, I think, where people are going to get very fed up and they're going to start taking it out on the ballot box because we want our communities to be vibrant places, absolutely. We want them to be socioeconomically balanced. I don't think that's the question here, but what we are doing is creating an imbalance. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. All right, thank uh, you. Can I ask me a question? One question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, first, how, hey, um, thanks for taking the time to speak to us, but uh, how long have you lived in Pasco County? 12 years. And so, um, you know, I was on the school board before I was on the county commission, and I can tell you that when you move to one of the fastest growing counties in America, the school system is going to be, and the transportation system, those are the last to catch up because we don't build new schools until they can pretty much open full. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's part of the price we're paying for living in a uh, fast growing community that everyone apparently wants to move to. Um, also, I just just so you know, probably 26% free and reduced lunch is probably the lowest number in the whole county. I'm waiting to get uh, numbers on that, but that is uh, that's a really no number to have on free and reduced. So, no, just is, just let me know that. All right, thank you. Talking about free and reduced lunch, the ma I'm going to say the majority of the schools on the west side of the county are Title I schools, right, which 50%, means 50% or more. more. Of that's all of our it. of all of these children are on free and reduced lunch. Yeah. So, thirty percent. the question, Mr. McBride. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank Mark. you, Mr. McBride. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think you're here. I think we got. Oh, he's uh, our next speaker is uh, Joel oh. Two, and there may be others speaking along with him. I think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Joel again. Can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, Barbara Wilhite and I collectively represent a number of your property owners who are tax paying citizens and also some multifamily developers who obviously are stakeholders 
And uh, based upon the discussion at the prior uh, commission hearing, when you scheduled this workshop, we thought it would be appropriate to ask our industry clients to pay the cost of retaining an independent qualified market consultant to try to come up with actual data and analysis rather than speculation and conjecture to provide better information in all fairness for you commissioners to make a fully informed decision as to where you think the policy of your county best should be directed. So they did that and they retained Leslie Deutsch, who is with John Burns Real Estate Consulting, a national marketing uh, analyst firm. They have been used by Pasco County previously as the county's own consultants. So we assert that they have credibility and expertise in the business. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Leslie to make a presentation that she has prepared and provided to your staff. And she's going to go through that. I do ask respectfully, if you would please allow her to actually deliver and complete her presentation so that there's continuity and logic and flow. And then she will be more than happy to backtrack, answer any questions, respond to any challenge or argument or just uh, different opinion uh, because she's qualified and that's what she does. But please allow her to go through that if you would be kind enough to do that. Once she concludes, I'm gonna make a few brief concluding remarks on behalf of the stakeholders because I think apart from her analysis, uh, the discussion so far has raised, I think, some serious questions that we at least need to highlight about uh, what what is going on and what the real policy and the real concerns are. So with that, I turn it over to Ms. Deutsch. Uh, Leslie, if you're online, uh, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, present. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, I just wanted to ask about my slides. Did, are they going to go up on the board or do I... There you go. Thank you so much. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Leslie Deutsch. I am a managing principal here at John Burns Real Estate Consulting. Uh, we are a nationally recognized real estate consulting firm. We have about 15 offices around the country. I manage all of the consulting um, projects in the East Coast, and I also write our apartment report nationally. Um, and do all of our apartment forecasts. So I have been in this role for over about 15 years now. Um, I spend my days and my nights traveling around the state of Florida, I'm a Florida native, um, but also up and down the Southeast and the East Coast. And our clients are a range of builders and developers and uh, landowners really that are looking to build the, the, the appropriate product at the right price. So I have worked with many, many builders in Pasco County. I've worked with apartment developers. I've worked with some landowners in Pasco. Um, I have watched Pasco grow from for the last decade now to a very quiet town to a very vibrant, very vibrant area. So I was asked, and, and I just I want to reiterate that that we are a very independent firm. We we are we are not brokers. We don't write on behalf of anyone. We take all the this analysis and and uh, and numbers and put it together and come up with our own conclusions. Um, and very rarely do, will we change them for, for any um, builder, developer, et cetera. So, um, so here today, what I, what I was asked to do was to take a look at Pasco County, to look at the growth, um, to look at the demographics, to look at the apartment market, and then really um, to do what we do best is, is really hone in on the demographics to understand what the future demand is going to be for apartment rentals in Pasco County. And I will take a step back and say that we do have a demographer on staff full time that does forecast um, by market and by age and by income the, the demographic growth. And that's what we used here for each really for every county across the country. So um, this is the report I think that was presented to you. I, I have um, what we first did was look at the location of Pasco County. Clearly, it is a very good apartment location given its access to all, nearly all of Tampa. It has good schools, so renters want to live in good schools as well as homeowners. Um, and, and it continues to grow. And in order to continue to grow and see that growth, you need all types of housing uh, for sale and for rent. Uh, then I'll go into the demographics of Pasco County. I think it's one of the most interesting counties in the state of Florida is that it's a very, very wide mix of older residents and younger residents. And that mix 
really demands a wide variety of housing if you want to continue that growth. Um, and then I looked into the apartment market and I, I will explain um, the, the page that, that was pointed out. It is only projects that were built since 2010. So I, we took a look at what the, what the newer apartments and how they were performing. And to be perfectly honest, they're almost fully occupied, nearly all of them. Um, so because of their high occupancy rates, that's one indication that you really do have a lot of demand. But on top of the current conditions, what we did was we looked at the future conditions. So we have a rental demand model, very detailed. We use it across the country. Um, we really use it for, for, we've used it really everywhere. Um, and what it does is it takes stock of everybody living in a county today and then forecasts forward five years. And it does so by looking at their incomes and also looking at their ages. So then you can see what's really in demand. And what we did, would say, all right, well, how many people, based on an income, a $50,000 income, which is about your median income in Pasco County, translates to $1,300 a month, which is a class A apartment rent. So how many people are there today and how fast will that grow over the next five years, which will give you a number of how many more units you're gonna need to really satisfy demand if you want to continue to grow and have people to support all the industries that are that are planning, all the companies that are moving to Pasco and the new industries that you want to attract. So the next page, please. Um, so I'm gonna start with the location. Um, so what I did first, the next slide, please. I compared Pasco County, the main demographics of Pasco County to the Tampa MSA as a whole. So the Tampa MSA includes Pasco, uh, Hernando, Pinellas, and Hillsborough counties. What's really interesting is that Pasco County is the third largest county after Hillsborough and Pinellas, but the demographics are obviously it, the population's growing faster. Um, it, on this chart, you can really see that the median age in Pasco County is 46 versus Tampa 43. That's reflecting your retirees. But you also have a slightly larger household size. So you do have some families in Pasco and a growing number of families. What's really interesting is your median household income has really risen and, and improved to about the Tampa MSA average, about 55,000. Um, and the net worth is also a little higher, primarily because of retirees. So, so retirees don't come through in the income numbers, but they cut their, their net worth comes through um, with those numbers. So you see that there. Um, Pesco has actually a smaller percentage of renter house, excuse me, renter occupied housing units um, and that's really because of the lack of, of, of supply relative to what, lack of availability relative to, um, to the Tampa MSA. Uh, the next page, please. So the next few slides that I'm gonna go through are, are really just an interesting look at the demographics um, and the location of Pasco. So I highlighted 75 and Suncoast on there. Um, and what it's showing is every dot on that map accounts for 10 jobs. So you can see that the, now it, it, does not, um, it does not indicate whether it's a higher paying job or a lower paying job, but does represent a number, I'm sorry, not jobs, employees, I, I apologize. 10 employees, we don't do the, the businesses because it, you know, one business could have 200 people. So these are the number of employees. So you can see the concentrations here along the highways and along the access routes. I think that's really important because that, that's, that's where you need that, that extra housing but I just thought this was a good overview to, to understand where the jobs are in Pasco County. They are growing much faster in the Wesley Chapel and the Lakes area. Um, Newport Ritchie, they've had the job cent centers there for quite some time. Um, Zephyr Hills, you can see that the concentration over there, um, mostly on the, the more service oriented jobs, but there are a number of jobs there. The next page, please. Um, pop, this is the same chart. One dot is 20 people, but it shows the population density. And, and really what, what it's highlighting here is that people tend to be living around, it, uh, there are a lot of people in the established areas of Pasco, but it's a growing number in the Wesley Chapel, Land Lakes, Zephyr Hills, where there's availability uh, um, of housing and, and really where people want to live. So you can really see that concentration. And that's where a lot of the apartments um, tend to be located and tend to want to locate where the people are living today. Keep going, please. Next chart. Uh, the next chart shows your median household income. 
Um, so this really depends. A lot of the higher end housing you can see in Wesley Chapel and, and even further north on 75. So this gives you a sense of where the um, higher income levels are, are located. Uh, the next slide. I'm going to go through some of these. I can always come back. The median ages. This one's so interesting to me, and it really lends to um, Pasco's diversification of age. Is is that really um, the the lighter, the darker the blue, the older the uh, median age of the resident is. So you can really get a sense that there is a mix across Pasco, and it's really another reason to show um, the need for for a, a wide variety of housing. Next slide, please. This is a similar slide. It shows the average household size. So you can see the more families in the in the uh, the darker purple areas, um, and the retirees along the coast in the lighter purple areas. But really, um, it, it, the families. What we're seeing a lot with the apartments is is the families are using them as a stepping stone to eventually um, live in Pasco County, and and that's a really important thing because people like to try out a place before they decide decide to to purchase a home. So the apartments are really been that. Um, has, have served dual purposes for people that are choosing to rent, but also people that are about to, um, to buy a home or considering it. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, this is the next one. Sorry, I divide my sections up. Um, this chart didn't come up, but it, this, is the, this is just a highlight of the apartments that have been delivered since 2010. So these are only the newer apartments in Pasco County. And the reason I did this is just to understand have you oversupplied on the newer, uh, more expensive apartments, if you will? So we took all of these different apartments um, and, and then on the next slide, and there's actually been about 6,000 of them delivered since 2010. Um, the next slide shows just some highlights of some of the, the class A product that has been delivered. But on the next slide, what you can see is I took all of those 6,000 units, looked up the, um, the occupancy rates of each and every one of them, and the, the dark blue line here shows you that Pasco County's Class A market has a 96.2% occupancy rate. And most apartment uh, developers will tell you, and owners, I'm sorry, will tell you that about 95% is full occupancy. You're going to have to always have a few units that are turning over. So Pasco County's Class A market has a higher occupancy rate than Tampa Class A market as a whole. So I compared it to the projects built since 2010 in Tampa. So really showing you the strong demand for, for Class A in Pasco County um, and the growth, despite all the, the new supply that's hit the market. Um, on the next slide, we do the same comparison, but show it through rents. And, and this is really interesting. You can see the rise in rents in Pasco County. That's the blue line on the bottom. But Pasco still remains relatively affordable to Tampa, which is also a reason that a lot of um, a lot of people, young professionals, and, and even retirees are moving to the area to, to rent there. The apartments are just as well done and just as nice. They happen to be a little bit less expensive. Um, okay, let's keep going. I'm going to move into the apartment demand. The next slide highlights our demand model. Um, I, this is this is one of my favorite project, the favorite types of demand to look at. What you can see here is in 2020. If you follow my math, the total number of renter households today in Pasco County is about 59,547 people that are renting some type of, of unit in Pasco. We expect that to grow to about 67, 68,000, you know, rounded by 2025. But if you, in that growth, if you're following across, is a total of 8,400 households and an annual growth of about 1,700. I'm just rounding here. That, then what we do is we divide the entire population of renters by income level. So what that's telling me is those with incomes above 50,000, I'm cutting that 59,000 number less than half almost. Um, and really only about 23,000 people can afford $1,300 a month. So, so now I'm really focused in on do we need more class A rental uh, properties because do we need people, do we have people that can afford that? We've got 23,000 people that can afford it and we expect that number to grow by about 5380. Um, so over the next five years. So, so the big question is you really need another 5380 units to satisfy what could be the growth in demand. And I, and I will caveat this model with a number of things. This model looks at incomes. 
Now, I mentioned earlier that retirees don't have an income. So it, it is undercounting the number of retirees that would rent. They have a higher net worth, they might own a house or they might have savings, but no income. So this model is conservative in its numbers. It also doesn't reflect anyone that might downsize from a home to a, a, a rental community. This is just population growth is all I'm looking at. So I, I just want to reiterate that this is a conservative number. So we expect about a thousand people um, each year to, to want to have a, a, a class A apartment, if you will, as defined by $1,300 a month to, to, uh, in Pasco County. So this gives you a sense of the, of the future demand. So I do want to just reiterate that it's about 5380 units that would be needed to satisfy just the population growth over the next five years. Um, and that's where we came to in terms of what's needed um, for Pasco County. If you, if you go to the next slide or two, I thought, and this has come up in the conversations, I've been listening to the conversations, I thought it was important to take a step back to talk about renters um, because the renter population, and we do a lot of demographic research, has changed dramatically in the U.S. over the last decade, really. Um, and I put this on here because we, we trademarked a term called Serban, um, and Serban describes Pasco County to a T. In fact, you all, I took this and ran with it uh, a couple years ago and put it in their Emerging Trends um, report. But Serban is not an urban area and not a pure suburban sprawl area. It's, a, it's an area where a lot of people want to move these days. They don't want to live in the expensive urban markets, but they want to live in the suburbs, but have a little bit of a feel of urban. Um, they can either, and I highlighted some things on this graph, you, you have slightly better schools, you have lower crime in urban areas. You've got some kind of walkability. You've got some vibrant restaurants and it's lower than lower price than an urban area and, and public transportation, which is harder to find in Florida, I must admit, but we're all working on it. Um, so, so these urban areas are the hot spots across the country. And, and when I do these national presentations, I'm, I'm pointing to areas like Alpharetta in, in Atlanta and, and uptown South End in Charlotte. These are the markets that people are moving to. And they're not moving there permanently always, but they're moving, so a lot of them want to rent. So these rents get higher premiums um, and homes get higher premiums if they're walkable, but it's a little harder. But this is an argument for some density in, in suburban markets, because this is really the, the trend of the future. And what we've seen is really the growth prospect of where people are moving. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we did a survey across the country and asked people where they would like to live. I think this is really interesting. It's just color coded by age and the ages are on the bottom. You would expect the young people to want to live in these servant environments, but really, and that is true, right? These are people less than 30 years old, 52% of them chose servant. Um, but then look at the other end of the spectrum. And this defines Pasco County to a T. It's got the young as well as the older. And the, the older also want to live in these servant environments. And this is a huge change from decades past. This is a new retiree and a new empty nester that wants to live in this sort of vibrant area where you can walk to a grocery store, or walk to a, a Starbucks or what have you. And the next slide, please. Um, and, and I just, I wanna bring it back to prove these numbers. Um, some of these get, came a little off, but what this is showing you, um, this is the rentership rate by age. So you can see the low down here. Um, and I'll tell the, the top line is the 25 to 29 year olds. Obviously, those are the renters. Um, the green and the, the orange on the bottom is the 35 to 39 year olds. Um, and I have a full report here that shows the delayed milestones of a lot of 30 to uh, 30 plus year olds. They're, they're getting married later. They're leaving their house later. They, um, they're having children later. And what does that mean is that they're more inclined to rent before they really settle down. So you can see the general pattern of growth. Um, I had it covered up. If you see the dip coming in 2020, that is a COVID dip. Um, the census admits their numbers are no good. Uh, I just wanna point that out, um, but those are the official numbers. We have talked to the Census Bureau and they have admitted that they were forced to, to put out a number. They know it's not right. So please ignore the dip. I had it covered up, didn't show in the, in the presentation. Um, but really what I want you to focus on here is, is the growth in the rentership. And if you go to the next slide, the same is true for the older Americans. And this is so important and really shocking information. But since 2005, the bottom line is 65 to 69 year olds 
the green line is 60 to 64 and the blue is 55 to 59. Look at the rise in rentership rates. And this is just a, a complete break from past. Renting is not considered a bad thing anymore. It's not considered, oh, you're a renter, you don't have enough money. It's a choice and it's a choice by a lot of empty nesters. They wanna live near their kids. Uh, you're really supplying some, some rental space that, that you know, they, their kids, they wanna live near their grandkids. Um, and there's really this, this movement here and, and Pasco, the, the demographics, the location and, and everything about it really speaks to this is as these families move in, you're gonna have a lot of people that wanna live close to their grandkids. And this is reflected in the national numbers, but also you wanna have the space for them to live you know, not permanently, but for a couple of years while their grandkids are growing up. So I just wanted to bring in some national data to kind of back the fact that th there are more renters than there used to be, um, that there's different different demographics are renting than there was before, and that Pasco County, um, shown by our demand model, is going to need um, over, was over 5,000 more units over the next five years just to account for those that can afford to live in Class A. Uh, and with that, I believe I'll, I'll stop talking and, and I'll take questions. Um, if anyone has them, feel free. Okay, any questions? I don't, I don't really have a question. I just have a statement. I mean, you mentioned earlier about the 2010 or 20, whatever the other year study, but I have, a, I have a list. And this is just, again, for the record for my fellow commissioners and whoever's watching at home, is that on your Class A apartment communities map and inventory, I am actually have a list and I'll put it up in a little while. You'll see it. I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight that aren't listed on there. And you're stating 2010 to 2020. Some of those will were built between that time. So just so you know that, um, you know, not telling you you're wrong, but um, those aren't included. So for whatever reason, those weren't included. And that's quite a few that weren't included in your study. So, you know, it's, it's the truth. It's a fact. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Well, I, th I thought that was an excellent presentation, and I um, spent a good part of the day the other day listening to the ULI Trends Conference. I don't know if anyone else followed that. Yeah. And so, Mr. Balls, you and I both heard the presentation on uh, apartments and the um, the and Pasco and the um, exactly what this this young lady is saying. Um, and I, I want to stress that walkability part of what you're saying. And I also just got another report. I don't remember who it was from about how important that is in, in commercial development as well. So um, people want to have a sense of place and they want to be able to get out and walk about. And um, uh, I just agree with everything you're saying here. And um, I, I think we're going to see a demand for a while. And I, I just hope to send some of it over to the 19 corridor and get um, get some of these going on our side because you know we don't have we haven't received one new restaurant like the Wesley Chapel area has and my guess is that's uh, well what they're telling me is we don't have the density over there in Trinity like they have over here so there's you know you want to have the malls you want to have the highway close by you want to have the community college close by, you want your hospitals close by, you're going to have density close by. And I, I think that's just classic, but I would guess, but, um, but who's one of so, that? So, so we talk about class a apartments. Is that the only kind of rental that's built pretty much? Is that just kind of curious about that? No, no, the occupancy rates, I, I focused on class a cause we were talking about new construction coming in. Um, but the occupancy rates in Pasco are are very high. Um, so so they're really across the board because there's a whole other argument I could do here for for affordable housing, right? And and then oh, we'll about that. yes, no, no, no. I, <laughs> there is there there. This was just very very focused on on new construction, right? On the, the and new construction is expensive, um, but there also is a is a need for for affordable housing as well. I would I would argue that a lot of the older apartments are. Um, like you were mentioning, they are almost overcrowded because people are looking for affordability as well. So, so we can do the, the same demand model where I only focused on the $1,300 a month above, I can do 1300 and below, and there's still even more demand on that side. So I agree with you. There, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of growth in Pasco and it has to be 
it has to, unless it's going to stop, unless you want it to stop, you need to have housing to, to, help, to solve that growth, to help the growth. Yeah, and I'd love to talk to you sometime about doing something like this on the workforce housing side. Um, but thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad that Ms. we got Ms. this. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, per the expected growth rate that you had went over, at this point, we're not going to be able to meet the needs of the Pasco residents pertaining to the numbers that you're actually providing. Now, I don't know if you have accessibility, because I know earlier we were talking about the number of children that are living in apartments, and it just seems that the Class A apartments have less kids than the other apartments of the 19,000 apartments that we have on the west side of the county, because a lot of them have turned to that affordable housing. Yeah, that is true. Um, a lot of the newer projects don't have as many three bedroom units. Um, I, and I don't, I honestly don't know if that's, that's zoning or choice of the developers. That I think it's about a third, a third and a third. Yeah, so it, <laughs> it tends to, so, so you're right. The older projects tend to have larger units and and more bedrooms. So, but they also you know tend to be looking for more space, and more space costs more money. So you're right. I, there's there's other options for for multifamily housing for rentals for families. Um, so that's a that's another conversation as well. But the class A kind of three or four story mid rise typical apartment usually has a smaller size unit and it's really to bring the rental rate down. Um, so I, I think that's why you don't see as many families. It's just a space issue more than anything. And then do you have any suggestions to help pre plan for 20 to 30 years from now for when these apartments do turn into affordable housing? Because that's what it seems like has happened on the west side of the county. Yeah. I, um, Yes, I, I don't, I don't see that as I, yes, that that has happened in some areas. I think because a lot of these new apartments are on these major corridors that go down to Tampa, they're going to, they're going to not necessarily turn into affordable housing. Um, I don't, I don't see that quite as happening. The access from, from the east, the west side, sorry, we're on the east coast. The access from the west side is a little bit harder. And a lot of the, the giant job centers and the big commuting patterns really follow Suncoast and 75. So I really do think that there's going to be a very long term trend. The, the other thing I will say is, is I, I talked a little bit about the demographics and the changing demographics. 20 years ago, you rented because you had to rent and you were kind of there was a, a perception issue with renters. Now it's a renter by choice and it's become a much more popular choice by a lot of young and older and, and everyone in between. So I'm not sure that same trend of kind of falling into disrepair is gonna happen again. The demand for apartments has really risen over the last year, last couple of years, really due to the changing demographics. So I don't know if it's gonna, I don't, I wouldn't say it's gonna follow that same trend. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Since you've mentioned you've done a lot of studies and, and know this area well, do you, do you know West Shore Boulevard very well? Yes. Okay, so back in the 90s, um, you're probably aware that they really built up West Shore with apartment complexes, um, mostly on, I'm gonna say that would be what the south side of Gandy, if I'm not correct. Is that right? South side of Gandy, a lot. And then you had it in the north side as well. Um, you know, you have like the Cove apartments and such. So they started building them up and they're coming up left and right. I know that because the first time I moved to Tampa, I lived in Heron Point. Mm -hmm. I was 24 years old or whatever, working, working in Tampa. Um, and that's where I lived. And then what I saw happen throughout the years were quite a few of them either go downhill or Georgetown Apartments, which was right on the bay, right on the bay. That site is still there. It's, it's a dilapidated site you know, got overrun by the bright, shiny, and new. They couldn't keep up with the Joneses per se. They couldn't handle the amount of influx of apartments along West Shore, and they deteriorated. And it, it took a long time. They stopped renting because they weren't able to keep up with those apartments anymore. You know, they, they couldn't maintain them anymore because they weren't getting the amount of renters there to maintain the apartments. Eventually, many years later, they actually demoed it. Um, but it's still not cleared and not clean and cleared up. And that's been what, 15 years, 20, or at least since they've done that. So 
you know, when, that is a possibility because I've seen that's a perfect example of it happening because they were packed on top of each other and they still are, you know. Yeah, but I would also argue since the 1990s, West Shore has become sort of the main, it took all the office demand from downtown Tampa and became sort of the main, the largest office center of all of Tampa. And a lot of that reasoning was because there was housing for people right there. So yeah, I, But it I, couldn't keep up. It yeah, didn't keep it up. It didn't keep up for the office. Sorry. They didn't keep up. So yes, there was demand. But there was an oversaturation with apartments and the other ones could not keep up. That's why we're seeing what we see there today. Yes, but but it, it is a different world today. I mean, there is an entire investment class now that are buying value add properties and putting tons of money into it and bringing them up to up to code and bringing them up to demand. So there's well, much was, more. Yeah. Those, th those were, so, you know, Heron Point and some of the other ones are perfect examples of class A um, apartment complexes. Very beautiful pool, resort side pool, in, indoor racquetball courts, mm -hmm. um, air conditioned racquetball courts, the gyms. And so my point is, yes, those are very nice. We're not talking about, and I don't, and again, I, I don't want to get off subject here when talk about, um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Um, don't want to talk, you know, about income and classes and things like that. That's not, that's, the last thing we need, I think we should even get into and have a conversation about the fact was, is there was a, a supply and demand issue. The supply took over the demand and some of them periled. And what we don't want to happen is this some, you know, we came in peril and perish. It's just, I, we do not want that to happen in this area. And that there lies my fear, and that lies the fear of many people in the community. We're going to see that same trend happen. I see where you're coming from. I would argue though that that trend also happens on the for sale side. If if you know there's on the what side? On the what side? On the for sale on the uh, housing side, right? Well, there we're are four We're not talking about houses. We're talking about apartments, though. That's the thing. That our subject matter is apartments right now, and that we're talking about the apartments being built in the amount of them being built. So I don't, we're not going to talk about houses. If we want to talk about houses, we'll bring that up another time. Okay. 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 Uh, Jack Mariano, do you want to say something? I don't see him on the board. I don't know if you got Ms. Starkey. Saw him a second yeah. Ago. So something that you said was very interesting to me as well. And you said that, um, some of the, uh, uh that, the, that these are, are very attractive for, um, young, skilled workers, educated workers, which I think is one of the selling points for us that helps us attract businesses here. And I think that's something else that was said on the ULI um, uh, trends conference with the national experts that businesses, the two things that, what two important things that people are looking for is one quality of life when a business is moving, because they can move anywhere is the quality of life you, and the and the availability of skilled workforce, which is one of the reasons why I spend so much time in workforce training. But to have these concentrations of 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 workers is a benefit for us when we try and recruit companies here. In my opinion, right. um, I do have a question. So, because I I can understand where there comes a point when you have too much. And and so what is that number? Because you know it's a you know we have a responsibility to have a balance, and so I don't know if anyone's told me yet what that number is, and um, and what happens if you don't have enough what enough rental housing in a community? What's the downside for that? So I I think that's a good question. I I try. It's, it's an elusive number. I try to quantify with enough would be 5,380 5, units over the next five years. I, I fully admit it's a model, so models can be models. That's probably a slightly conservative number. Um, but I, I will tell you, I've done a lot of work with landowners who, who want, you know, who want a lot of businesses and want a lot of retail, but you need the, the, the rooftops first before all of that comes. So. So like you had mentioned earlier, you, you need people before you get the businesses. You can't get the businesses before the people. So, so you have this huge opportunity that 
you are a very attractive area. You're getting new businesses coming in. We're, we're monitoring, you know, we're seeing the Amazons come in. We're seeing the hospitals being built. All these businesses are looking towards Pasco, but you're going to need the, the, the housing. And, and it's, it's not only rental housing, but rental housing plays a big role in it because a lot of people don't want to buy a house just yet. They're, they're more mobile than they used to be. They might want to work in this job for a couple of years and then move. But they're still, you know, taxpayers, and they still add to the value of the area. But I think it's very important that yes, it's about fifty three eighty is the number. It could be a little more. It could be a little less. It, it's that's probably a conservative number. But um, but if you right now you don't quite have enough because you're completely fully occupied. And the truth is, that the housing market is is going gangbusters as well, and it's getting very very expensive. So rental housing does offer an alternative to that. So, and, and we do expect home prices to really rise over the next five years pretty rapidly, double digits, uh, which is, you know, you're kind of running out of lots. We've had a great experience with the pandemic with people, well, that's, I shouldn't say it like that, but the housing market has had a great experience with, with really, a, a, you know, a rise in prices and a rise in demand. And, and you're going to need more, more rental units to accommodate that because you're gonna run out of lots and they're going to become more expensive. So I think it's a mix. So what what I, I think I've seen and knew we had a, our family had some property here and we held on to it and the market, you know, went over us into Hernando County. Mm -hmm. um, and so people would look to Hernando County because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. And um, and so then we have all the traffic of the Hernando commuters coming through Pasco County to get to the jobs in Hillsboro. I mean, oh. so so if you don't have the demand. I agree. Um, does that mean that um, when people are looking for a certain price point, they may keep moving yeah. till they find it? it yes. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, Hernando would be sort of the next frontier, but, but also because Hillsboro has kind of slowed down their development and they've run out of a bit of land. I mean, I... I know we're in Tampa, but if you look at what's happening in Manatee County right now, that's exactly what's happening is that the growth there is just unbelievable. And, and it's really because the, the developers and the, the people have kind of run out of space in Hillsboro. So I, I, you see that right just south of you. So I, I would expect the exact same thing to happen um, or they would just or the growth would go further south to Manatee. So I. I, I agree. I think, or, you know, I guess you could go, you can go east as well. Um, but, but you're right. That's what happens is that when you kind of run out of that um, attainable prices and, and land and, and inventory, the, the growth does go elsewhere. So I have some friends who um, both just retired last year. Um, they sold their almost, uh, well, probably a million dollar house uh, in Gulf Harbors and they are renting houses um, now it slowed down a little bit because of the pandemic, but they rented a house in coast in uh, let's see, um, Playa del Carmen. I think that's the Yucatan. I'm not sure what country that that is. Uh, but they they rented down there for three months. Now they're back here for three, and then they're going someone else for three, for three. So that's an example of a, uh, you know, an interesting rental user. And plus, I know a lot of people are selling their houses at this high time in the market. Yes. and renting just so they can go ahead and get out of their house now so it's an interesting uh time we're in yeah and you find seniors that are downsizing from big yeah. homes yes. into some and they might go in an apartment until they decide where they want to build their home so that's that's part of it yes. great report lastly i i enjoyed listening to it and Mr. i know Chairman. we all got have gained something from that report so okay. uh, from that report I don't see we're overrun with apartments. It might seem that way, but yeah, that was my question. Maybe because of the traffic and and because our infrastructure is lagging behind all the building of the homes and and uh, schools and things like that are lagging in behind until the infrastructure, the roads get built out to where it handles all the traffic. Because right now we got diversion of Vyman that is running behind. That's going to that. move traffic. We're going to have um, overpass interchange coming in that's going to spread out traffic so the area we're talking about is going to be relieved some of that traffic because it's going to spread it out because a new interchange and new roadways we're in the works right now building so uh, it makes sense what you what you're telling us so. mr chairman yes Mr. Okay. patrick thank you um 
I do like the idea with the Serban area, I think you called it. Um, so I was looking, is there a specific percentage of apartments that there should be per person, per household, per community, per oh, area? I'm trying to think of the answer to that. I, I you know, I, I think the average rentership rate, well, I can look at Tampa. Um, in Tampa, it's about 32%. I should know the U.S. number off the of, uh, rentals, rentals, 32% of the population in Tampa rents. Now that number in Pasco is 24, 25%, but that also has to do with, uh, you know, the, the amount of, of, of inventory available. So I think Tampa, the MSA on, on average is a good proxy. I think the, the U.S. number is, I should know this and I, I think it's 36% because I think the home ownership rate is 64. So I think it's 36, a little bit higher. Um, it's it's probably a little lower in Tampa as it should be in Pasco because relatively speaking, your housing is more affordable. You know, in, in markets like New York City, you have a much higher rentership rate or, or San Francisco. So 25 is relatively low. I would probably, you know, look more towards that 32%. But it will vary. I, I, it's a good question. I, I don't know the exact answer, but I think the champ MSA is a good proxy. What did you say the number of apartments that we did have in Pasco? 59,000? Or that's uh, just renter I, households? Oh, I only looked at the, oh, sorry, the, the, the renter households. Hold on one second. I got to pull that up. 59,000 renter households. Yes. But what about apartments? Was it about 50,000 or? Does that uh, include oh, apartments? Did you mean yeah, the, the market rate ones? Oh, just apartments. Oh, I can look that up. I don't have that number off the top of my head. It 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 varies. It, it, these are six, 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 yeah, two hundred. So we have we're at about a thirty three percent rental right now of availability because if you said there's about sixty thousand rentals and we have about two hundred thousand households in Pasco, so we're at about a thirty three percent rental capacity. Well, some of those might or be available. Stores. Well, where, how are you doing that math? Um, 60,000 renters. But I don't know how many and, households. Yeah, she's, she's doing her math, right? 219,259, I rounded it to 200,000. So 60,000 over 200,000, I just said about a third. Because six what? goes into that, about 18. So, so um, 18. when you do your, get those numbers are you getting those numbers from like the property appraisers who don't have homestead exemptions on them no these are census numbers so i um the rentership numbers are census numbers okay. yeah that you know that's interesting it's the first 2020s numbers we're seeing um dc yeah. doesn't have 2020 numbers so we have Nobody available have about 30 percent available that's rental properties <laughs> look at her look at her yeah. chart yeah. we don't have 2020 it, numbers the the these numbers are our ESRI is is forecasting forward 2019 to 2020. So it's census yeah, numbers. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we don't have true, Mr. Chairman. Let, let me ask one more thing because I know we need to okay. go, and I, everybody has wants to say something. I have a whole presentation as well. Um, so, you, one of the things you mentioned earlier was that you said there was a need. There was a need for more apartments because you need people to be here for the jobs. Now, I came here in 2014, and one of the biggest issues that constantly came up, and I'm so glad we've been working on it as a board and along with our EDC, was how many people, and it continues to be, how many people leave Pasco County every day to go to Hillsborough County to work, okay? Today, there are still are more people leaving to work outside of the county than live in the county. There's no, so we don't, it, it, saying that we don't have enough housing for our amount of residents that are employed in Pasco County is is uh, off by probably about 40, plus, 40 to 55% um, because that many people leave every day. Oh, Commissioner Oakley, you made a statement earlier at reference. I'm going to go back to it again about Wiregrass, for example. Oh, the mall at Wiregrass. There needs to be more apartments for those people there. Well, Not those are 10 to 12. Let me, well, I understand, but there's if you what tell me what's there besides retail right now. 
At the current, at the current, right now, what's out there? I'm talking about a mall. I'm talking about Wiregrass as a mm. development. Right. So, what other? My question is, what other jobs well, there? You got the hospital there. You College. got right. a lot of other things there. A lot of medical okay. facilities. Yeah. So you've got, you have the hospital. Yeah. They, they, they. Yeah. Yeah, there's plenty of housing for them. Um. I mean, I'm. So retail can't afford the apartments they're talking about. They're talking about class A apartments. So if you have a ten to twelve dollar an hour retail job, you can't do that. And there's no shortage for some of, some of them could because there's, there's there's no, two if you team up with other people, right? yeah, you can. But there's no shortage of housing because even pre COVID, if you were I know heck, I can't tell you how many high school and college kids couldn't find jobs at the mall. There was no openings. There was no opening. So if we use that as an example, there's not a shortage of apartments for the amount of people that are employed gonna, within that area. I, could, I will bet you a million plus I, dollars. I'm, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I know and, I'm right. Uh, I've got a, a friend who uh, owned a restaurant kind of thing, and, and um, he sold it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they grass? cannot find a place to live. In, in Wiregrass? No, on but we're talking about we're talking about one. I'm talking about one specific one, area right now. I'm referring to so, one area. So if I were to look up on Zillow, I could find a whole lot of places to live, um, to rent right now. No, in, that's in not. Wiregrass. That wasn't the point. The point was there's an there's enough people living in the area when it comes to supply and demand to meet the job needs currently. Well, how do you know that? So we because should I just have... told you, there's try to find an opening at one of those <laughs> locations right now. So we should have about thirty percent you know, of rental sense. homes available, <laughs> and you said we should have um, twenty four to twenty people. We have about twenty four to twenty five percent of rentals right now, and we should have we have thirty percent available of rental properties. Now, would the best area for an apartment complex be recommended near an Obviously, you need the infrastructure, but would you? Where would you want to have an apartment instead of housing? Apartment or housing. Instead of having an apartment complex, where would you want housing? Like a new housing. You're asking Leslie that. Yes. Hmm? Yes. Okay, Leslie. That's uh, for you, Leslie. <laughs> yeah. So, where would you best recommend an apartment complex over a subdivision? Would it just be next to an? A new business. Obviously, you want the roadways, roadways and infrastructure. But would you ra rather it be closer to the new business coming in, or where would you recommend an apartment over a subdivision? Uh, because of the density typically associated with an apartment complex, I think you would recommend it near highways and access to you know access to roads. So um, now. The truth is there is there is argument to have apartments in more suburban areas as well. It just really depends on the product. But but generally speaking, I would say access to employment to roads, public transportation. I roll my eyes. That's always a hard one, especially in Florida. But that's what you would want, right? You would want it so people can not have to use or, or have more than one car. Um, so just to keep the density issues down. So I there's not a perfect spot for apartments, but I would say I would definitely lean towards um, the access points to the roads and highways and and, and transportation. Thank you. One more last question for me. And this okay, is and then we got some more speakers. Yeah, I know. I yeah. So, okay. are we have more speakers like oh, yeah. citizens, or we have people yeah, we're, in the industry? I think Joel has something probably to say, and he may have somebody else to speak. Okay, so question for you when you did your your report and your study and this is one of the things that i talk about on a regular basis nobody here including myself is against apartments never said that the problem is getting to the point where you're oversaturated and we the issue myself and many of the constituents and a lot of people in the business community in this area um which i'm sure i'll be speaking a little louder in the coming months um we have so many current parcels that have the entitlements to build more. So I asked, did you take that into consideration? Because that's the big, big issue. So we think about the amount of entitled properties in the area that have the entitlements, have the zoning to build apartments. Why do we continue? And our issue is we continue to change zoning on parcels when we already have enough inventory to meet the demand that you just stated. And there's a plethora of them. We just talked about like Wiregrass, for example, Wiregrass plan. And I'd say that because these master plan communities, 
just as you stated earlier, plan well. And they're there. They're, the parcels are there ready to be developed tomorrow. There's a number of them. Like in the back of Seven Oaks, for example, there's one right now that has the entitlements. Meadow Point has multiple properties that have the entitlements between all four of the Meadow Points. And um, if you go down to some 54 or 56, there's a number of them too. So again, I continue with, that's my biggest issue. It's not the amount that is being built per se. I mean, I mean it is an issue for me, but when we keep doing this and we, we're going to run into that point soon because these guys already have the entitlements. We keep rezoning this land and they're and, and they're, they're going to be kind of left out in the cold too. So they worked through the process. They did good planning. They planned through the years. They, it may have been the eighties, nineties, two thousands, whatever it is. But as if this board continues to rezone all these parcels, it's done. And, and then we're losing. So you talked about jobs earlier too. Well, guess what? If we keep rezoning these other properties, there's not going to be any places left to have jobs because you're not going to have any parcels, land parcels to build on. And then what happens? So I guess the question is, did you look at all the properties that have, that have, current, that have the zoning or entitlements for the future when you looked at your study? No, I did not. That wasn't part of the study. I did not do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Jack Moreno. Oh, there's Jack. He came back. Oh, Jack? Yeah, I've been here. I was just I called for you a while ago, but I didn't hear you ask me. So. I, by the time okay. go when the conversation gets started, but, um, um, you know, Commissioner Moore, you bring up good points as far as like what we, what we need here. And, and you, you brought up the point, how many people are in the county are leaving to go back and forth? Now, I don't know what the zonings are with some of these properties. Could they have been industrial? Could they have been job creators? But we need to focus on the job creators here as well uh, coming up. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, it's a port, a, an important aspect. If we've got all the zonings and like I said, we, we know the metal points, they got a bunch of apartments that are going to be coming up. They're already zoned. I'm really scared that we don't know what our supply could be if everything was going to get built up. And if we're going to take very good property that could have been, you know, medical facilities or, and we're going to convert those to apartments because the demands there for a guy who wants to sell a piece of property, we're going to watch that. We already set a good balance. It's out there, but we need to know what that balance is before we've got start allowing more and more of these things to get rezoned. Good point. Hmm. Anything else, Jack? Okay, Leslie, thank you for all that, uh, your report. Very good. Um, we'll go back to uh, Joel to see if he has some words to say to us or if he's got someone else to speak. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just have a few concluding points. We're not, uh, we're not going to present another speaker. I think Ms. Deutsch has... Uh, has really covered the market analysis that she was asked to review. But from our stakeholders, my, my concluding car comments are, are six points. Uh, number one, as Mr. Steinsnyder pointed out at the beginning, I don't know where this is headed from the land use regulation standpoint, but I respectfully submit that any effort by land use regulations to distinguish between rental versus owned housing is going to be uh, frowned upon under state and federal fair housing laws and discrimination against rental versus owned housing. There's a lot of law out there on that. And as a legislative body, I, I'm just not sure it's prudent for you to go down that path. And I don't know how you start regulating from the land use standpoint, how a property owner uses their multifamily housing for condominiums or townhomes versus apartments. I, I don't think it's legal. I'm not even sure it's good policy. Uh, and it's certainly not very inclusive. Uh, and it doesn't recognize the need for workforce and affordable housing. That's point number one. Point number two is there was some reference to school issues and, and, and crowding. I just want to remind everyone, which, which obviously you know, that school concurrency applies it doesn't matter if it's a single family subdivision, an apartment complex, a townhome project, school concurrency applies to every one of us. So 
in your location with your existing capacity, you're either going to get the approval of the school district or you're not. We all go through that in every plan amendment. We go through that in every rezoning and you have to pass muster. So that's really a red herring as to whether rental apartments cause an issue with school concurrency that some other form of housing does not uh, because everyone has to comply. Point number three, the comment from Mr. McBride, you know, that, that, that our new motto is open spaces and vibrant places. Um, you actually have to have concentrations of housing density. You have to have clustering to have open spaces. If you continue with the proliferation of large lots of urban single family housing, you will consume those open spaces and you certainly won't generate the vibrant places that require a walkable, concentrated mixed use development pattern. So I submit that having an adequate stock of apartment housing is entirely consistent and in fact necessary to promote open spaces and vibrant places in Pasco County. And if you have any question about that, contact someone at ULI and ask them if they think it's a necessary ingredient to open spaces and vibrant places. Point number four is, is I agree with Commissioner Moore entirely. We should be looking at supply versus demand. So whatever the commission needs to do to get comfortable as to what supply is and demand is, obviously should be done. With that said, this market analyst, it doesn't matter whether First of all, I believe her numbers are probably accurate because she has the data for the new Class A apartments built in the last 10 years. But if that is not correct, if there are other projects that have been built in the last 10 years, all that demonstrates is that there's been even greater demand than we think. That you've in fact absorbed more Class A apartments over 10 years and yet you still have full occupancy of them. The question isn't what's happened the past 10 years, the question is with the, with the indisputable demographics, the population increase, the median income, the rising median income in Pasco County, the change in lifestyle desires, are you going to have a demand from this point forward? And Leslie has demonstrated pretty good evidence from, from non-opinion, just empirical data that you have a conservative need for at least 6,000 more Class A rental apartments over just the next five years. So that's point number four. The demand clearly is going to be there. Point number five is, and I hope no one seriously going to consider this, but the option of a moratorium that staff suggested will be an immediate buzzkill to your potential employers. If, if you are serious as a county commission to continuing the wonderful effort that you've put out there and the progress you made at Connected Cities, and Lynn Angeline and Wiregrass and everywhere else in this county to employment generation, you, 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 ask, you ask your Economic Development Council and your own Department of Economic Analysis whether they think a, a published moratorium from this county commission, whether that's gonna be a buzzkill to their effort to attract potential employers who, as Leslie indicated, are relying upon this workforce housing to support those jobs. And sixth and finally, um, I'm concerned that the commission will get into picking winners and losers in the marketplace. That is not what the government is supposed to do. The government under land use regulations is supposed to analyze a specific proposed use in a specific geographic location under your existing comp plan policies and determine whether that proposed use is consistent with the comp plan and reasonably compatible with existing surrounding or future planned uses. You do not as a commission decide that, well, there's an apartment approval here and three apartment approvals over there, and we can't approve this location until those other three get built. If those other three were the best preferred market location, guess what? That developer would have put one of those parcels under contract, not the one they have in front of you. These guys are now required to invest about $50 million. That's five zero million dollars to develop one of these luxury class A apartment complexes. 
they would not make that decision. They're looking at these numbers every Monday morning, not once every year or every two years, like you're saying. They're looking at them every Monday morning, their company, their shareholders, their own paycheck, depend on them making the right decision and picking the right property. And if you carry the analysis that, well, we can't approve too many multifamily sites, um, or we're gonna, we're gonna kill the marketplace, then pray tell why is the county approved dozens of employment centers. Under that logic, you would approve only one employment center at a time until that gets completely developed and built out so no one's competing with that employment center. You don't do that. You approve them in any location that's in a transportation corridor and a market location that makes sense. You allow the employer in the private marketplace to pick which of those needs to go first, and that's what you do. So those are just the policy points we would like to make beyond the data. I think this is very treacherous ground and really uncharted territory for this commission. I've been, I've been doing this for 41 years. I worked my way through Pinellas, Hillsborough County, and Pasco. I've been in Pasco for over 20 years, and I've never seen the Pasco County Commission adopt a policy that tried to control the free marketplace and direct where it was going to make investment. That is anathema to what I understand all of you stand for and what you ran for election for. You guys are free market people. And that's all I have to that's all I, no, it's not inappropriate. It's a fact. It's a free market system and the county, the county commission should not legislate the free market system. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joel. All right, oh, so. Mr. Moore? Well, I'm gonna wait and let them go because so, it's our conversation now. Okay, it's back to the board. Uh, we need Terry back up. Um, I don't know, because I have a few things I wanna put up right now. Okay. All right, Mr. Moore. Um, going back to one statement, it's uh, something that's never been happened before. Um, actually, this, this, this commission um, actually just put a moratorium on um, on storage units not too long ago, so that did happen. That's a fact. Um, so I, I wanted to bring it just a, a few things up again. So I, you know, when I talk about again, I, I'm, this is it's almost getting old because I having to say the same things over and over again. But when we talk about a certain portion of the county, and I go from that forty one to Bruce B. Downs corridor area, whether it be 54, or whether it be on Wesley Chapel Boulevard, um, multiple roads in between, that's where the majority of these lie, and that's where the majority of them are being built, and that's where the majority of them are coming in for approvals. These aren't large master plan communities anymore, and actually Mr. Two brought up a point about, about that a second ago, and we have many, many sites that again, that have the entitlements already to build apartments. Plenty and plenty of sites. And, you know, I wish, you know, because I had some emails that I went over earlier that we could have gotten staff to have the brought, would have brought those here today and done that due diligence and that research so we can make good decisions. And I'll request some things at the end here. Um, but when we think about the community, like I mentioned before, I did this poll. And if you look, if you, I think you all saw the um, Mark study, the uh, citizens survey, and it was brought up on the citizen survey too. And if you look at the areas that have the, there was an area and a couple of districts that the community felt they had the best What's the word I'm looking for? Again, what was, I'm trying to remember what that statement was. It felt that- um, MBSM? No, 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 it was the most, no, 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 no. It was the most, it was the most um, confidence in government. And this area had the most confidence in government by 61%. So they're trusting us to do the right things and trusting us to do, do the right things moving forward. So this poll again was taken during the holidays. I'm, I'm sure more people that were unsure, no opinion would have taken more time to, to respond. Um, but again, out of those 400 people, and this is scientific poll, there was people that were homeowners, renters, um, 
didn't matter, obviously, um, you know, they didn't Who go by voter rolls call? or anything like this. These are random calls of people in, in, in within that, those zip codes um, within mostly District 2, but some went to, went to uh, Commissioner Starkey's District 2 because it's kind of hard to <laughs> go across 56. Is and this not, our poll? Have we run this poll? So this is what I showed you last, uh, two meetings ago. Oh, this is yours. But that, that, yeah, that was it has a county stamp on uh -huh. as far as water. So again, you know, when this poll was done, do you approve or disapprove the amount of apartments in your community? So 38 to 38.5 to 24.25, and then there was the unsure part. Go to the next one, please. Would you prefer to see more office and commercial development or more apartments being built? So the community feels that what's best for their community are more office and commercial compared at 49% compared to apartments at 14.745. And go to the next slide. Do you believe more apartments should be approved and built in Pasco County? No. Fifty-seven point seven five percent said no. Eighteen point two five percent said. And what are the yes. demographics of the people who answered this? What I said was they were. It was. They, it did not matter. Obviously, your what your demographic was. These are random households that were polled. One hundred percent random household. The whole county. No, I said this was mostly in District Two. Some of it went into your district because it's hard when it comes to zip codes. Okay. 33544 goes from District 2. Stafford Hills one. and Land Lakes. And I can pull up the, let's pull, I can tell you exactly the zip codes. I was just going over, because if you remember last, the last meeting, I told you the zip codes and I went over that, but I can tell you the zip codes again. I don't, I this mean, is, I, I would just see it on a map of where yeah. they answered. So it's, it's, but if it's the it's majority of Seven Oaks, No, 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 it's 41. No, well, again. District two, your part of your district as well, all the way from 41 up into Zephyr Hills. I think on my district, it's all built out on the south of 54, except for the key. Uh, it doesn't matter. Property. Some of the, some people in your yeah. district were ones that answered this as well. I focused on that area too, district two. So again, I'm, I'm just showing you what the community feels. So you need to know how the community feels and this is how they feel. It's a fact. Can you go to the next slide? We'll tell you the zip codes again. And remember this from last time, and there's, where did Terry go? The, the, the zoning parcels, the map of, and I'm going back to district two again, where the majority of these are located right now. You see how many sites there are. We can, also, if, you don't have, if you don't have this, we'll make sure you have it. But it's also the same place you're gonna find all the infrastructure and all that we've built in there to handle all that traffic. Okay. That's our hub that we run. That's your hub? Well, I mean, I'm just saying, is it your hub for what? What is it your hub for? That's where right people there. live and people travel out of that area. That's why you got a Diversion Diamond going there. That's why you got overpass. Yeah, I work I work really hard on the Diverging Diamond, so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm aware of the Diverging Diamond. Um, but at the same time, going back to look at how many parcels are already and already have the zoning for more multifamily. Can you go to the next one? So this, I wanted to bring this up again, because if you looked at the person's survey before they brought up, they don't include a bunch of these for whatever reason. So those are current ones. I know we're missing a couple too, because it's a couple have gone up since, but that's okay. Those are current ones in that area. Might be under the 1300 a month uh, rent, rent. I'm just I, guessing, I don't know. Because she did 1300 and above. Well, I this know because those, <laughs> Those definitely aren't, a lot of those definitely are not. I don't know if any of those are actually under 1300 a month. I don't know. Yeah. Can you go to the next one? But I just want to compare those with those. And then there's other projects too. Charleston at Wesley Chapel, 228. Cypress Creek Town Center, 300. Um, Aiken MPD, which is 252. Lexington Oaks just got billed at 248. Lexington Oaks has signs like crazy out there, you know, apartments available. Do I have another one? Yeah, they just open them. Yeah. Um, it's been about a year ago, probably. Okay. Yeah, so the about a year ago. it takes time. So po possible future, <laughs> but remember they said earlier there's a big need. They 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 would be in there right now if there was a big need. Fuck Hay Road, which you guys let go through today. Um, parcel S19, and that's in the back of the Seven Oaks community. That already has um, has gone in front of you. Two already have entitlements that could move forward. 
um, possible on, on 56, where it turns into 54, possible age restricted, which was brought up. I met with an applicant that talked about age restriction right, right north of 54, where Wesley Chapel Boulevard meets Bruce B. Downs as well. So there's a more, and those aren't within, again, the big master plan communities we talk about that are already there that have been very, very thoughtful in the future and staff in the past was very thoughtful in working with them. It just gets back to my point is stop rezoning land until those are built up. It's just got to stop. And until I think when we talked about there's certain options that staff was given us, to be honest with you, unless somebody already has entitlements, because we never want to take somebody's entitlements away. Mr. Two said that earlier, and I agree wholeheartedly. We're never, if somebody has a zoning already in place, somebody has entitlements, you should not look at taking that away. No way. I agree. Go to, go to the next slide real quick. So that was the national, uh, our uh, citizen survey presentation. Again, includes its opportunities for improvement, mobility, rapid growth, multifamily housing. That's what the citizen stated. Go to the next one. So we talked about moratoriums earlier. These are just some examples of some areas that I found that have done, or done some or in the process. There's a lot more, but I didn't want to give you four or five pages worth of uh, examples, but City of Newport Richie just did it. City of Tampa um, just discussed this last Thursday. The City of Tampa, City of Claremont, City of DeBerry, Oakland Park, Winter Springs. Here's an example outside of the state of Florida, in Illinois, Massachusetts, Tennessee, uh, Ohio, Alabama, Fort Worth, Texas. Next one real quick. Here's an article, a recent article. Residents are concerned about straining resources, the difficulty of acting during a hurricane. Now there are too many apartments and being built in South Tampa. That's what they took up last Thursday, which is coming back to the city council. They did not come to a conclusion. Next. Again, system headlines. Again, there's people concerned about this all over the nation. A moratorium on new apartments. Some Fort Worth city leaders think the city's oversaturated. Newport Richie plans moratorium on apartment permits. No. They're, they're, oh. they're, I'm going to keep going for a sec. Next. I'm just giving you examples right now. Mayfield Heights Council considers moratorium on all future apartment construction. Next. Claremont did a six-month moratorium, if you know where Claremont is. You guys are familiar with Claremont, right? Right outside of Orlando? Oh, yeah, I know where it's at. Yeah. Just, one. Just north of East of here. Yeah. Right outside and right close to Haines City, close to 27. Next. Another headline. A couple other places. DeBerry, if you know where DeBerry is. Yeah. It's over in that area, too. They put a pause on it. They've been going through that, that, that Orlando area has been going through this for, for some time. Claremont's very similar to Wesley Chapel, a little smaller, but considered a suburb of Orlando next. So is DeBerry. Okay, that's it. So, you know, what I think we need to do is, personally is have staff actually work and bring back the parcels that are currently zoned and have the entitlements for multifamily. We need to see those. We have to see those to make a really, really solid decision moving forward. Yeah, the I would never want to take entitlements away from somebody that they're there, they're there, they have them. But for us to continue to consider on literally every block, every block from 41 coming up to Bruce B. Downs, if not more, to put one, put that many, that's insanity. There's there's a lot planned right out there where you're talking about, right in Wesley Chapel. I mean, from there back to 301 and back to other way toward 41. And I guess me personally, I, and again, I said earlier today that new development that we can, big master plan community, you know, that we made some approvals on today. And this Again, design well, makes sense, forward. walkable, walkable. These, some of these that we're talking about, the one today that came up on Hay Road, 
That's not walkable. You can't walk anywhere. You can't walk. Let me. You cannot walk. You can, the kids can't even walk to school. There's not even a sidewalk. There's not even going to be a sidewalk that goes to that school. That's Do you think that along these ones that are stacked up along Wesley Chapel Boulevard and 56 and 54, nobody's going to walk across Bruce B. Downs or State Road 56 or Wesley Chapel Boulevard. Where's they going to walk to? Another apartment complex? Well, hang on, because that plan that we just approved for Two Rivers has the school I on said the that's north a, side I said of the six-lane highway. Yeah. So I got a little problem with that. Well, um, it does. It has apartments. That's also a big master plan thing. community that's yeah, built that's into. Matter of point. There's, there's some right there. Anyone who's going to want to go to the park, is any child who's going to want to go to the park that's on the north side of State Road 56 is going to have to have mom or dad drive them unless they figure out a safe way to get over State Road 56. Well, they all have not, parks, I'm not, parks. I, I'm going to agree with you that I would have a lot of angst to flip over um, light industrial or any industrial into multifamily unless there was a um, live work situation yeah. where we had um, jobs and work together. What like like um, down at... Um, where Jabel is and where, um, you know, that when you went down to see that, um, what's that name of that? Not, what's that project that Jack was referencing? Caroline. That Daryl did. Caroline. Caroline. I mean, they got, they've got all kinds of mixes and employment right there and very, very dense. Um, I would like to see what's coming. Um, and I don't know that we've really seen that map. Um, I looked up Pasco Woods, by the way, which was on your list. And I think it wasn't on the other list because it's under 1300 and it's, it is 100% full. You can't, you can't rent anything in there. Oh, you just called so, um, no, it's, I went to the renters thing and it's, you, there's nothing available to rent. So that tells you demand is there. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the reports oh, you saw today show for people that live in Pasco or for people that are coming here and going people back trying, to Tampa? People trying to find an affordable place to live. It's there is no we doubt. We do not, affordable. I know that's not what we're talking about today, yeah. but um, I think it's, a, I, I, I would like to see the total number coming, but I think everything that is telling us we, we don't have enough still for what's coming. And we are... We are growing, growing fast. And if 100 people are moving to Pasco County a day, how many people, how many in those 100 are looking for apartment rental living? Right Maybe um, uh, Leslie could tell me what that number is because I don't do good math on the fly. It gets me in trouble. Where are they working, though? But, where are they working? Where are they, I'm just asking where they're working. We have jobs coming, too. So... So as we're attracting jobs, well, I, you know, I, I've got a list of the new jobs that are coming here. Yeah. Um, we, we have insurance, Santander, Santander we have Santa, Santa, Moffitt, Santander. we have. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, we do. But I'm saying, actually, where are those people coming for now? Have, and they're still going, do you see stacked up every day, State Road 56 got going to Tampa? Business park coming. We got the overpass business park coming. We have Santander with 875 <laughs> jobs. Where are they going to live? Okay. We want them to live in our county. Um, Mr. Chairman, Moffitt with all those Hold jobs, we, those people that go to Hillsborough every day won't have to drive to Hillsborough. They can have those jobs. Hey, That's what we want them to have. All right. The commissioner Fitzpatrick has. I'm trying to come up with different <laughs> solutions. Okay, so obviously we have about a 30 percent rental availability rate in Paso County. Whether they're rented right now or not, there's a 30 percent of available properties. Um, so there's re plenty of them. The problem is we don't have class A apartments is what to what her projection is. Now there's entitlements and there's also different the land uses that they can build the apartments in multifamily one, two, and three, C2, and then specific MPUDs. So if we're keep coming across the fact of if they're supposed to be commercial property and we want to live, work, and play, and we want more commercial businesses to come in, then why don't we limit the apartments or the multifamily homes to multifamily one, two, and three? So then why don't we just change the zoning and under C2 conditional use, take out the multifamily use? 
and then that's going to limit. So when people go to buy their properties, they're looking for multifamily one, two, or three, or creating their MPUDs instead of saying, okay, well, we're going to come in and change this commercial property when we want to be able to have businesses coming into Pasco County, we're leaving the commercial properties alone and allowing them for industries to come in. And then they're going just strictly to the multifamilies one, two, and three for their multifamily homes. Mr. Chairman, I, this, Mr. I think I got what you're saying. Basically what you're saying is, look, when we're, there was options to change land development code, mm -hmm. you're stating that pull multifamily out of- B2. B2. So you can't come back later for a conditional use, conditional use, right? A conditional use to make that change. Great idea. Um, I think, I think it's, a, that, you, would, that would take a, us to change, go through the process of changing okay, land so development code. Um, I think that's a So then it would idea. force so them to this find, going forward. do I just make a motion? Hmm. No. No, we can't no, just change today. the land development. Well, <laughs> yeah, it would be something we'd have to tell staff to look at and bring it back. But I think it's a great idea. And I think in the meantime, to, just to pile on with that a little bit, is that we as a board, you know, when we're, when we're hearing these come up, like we've heard some that want to change now to that, you have the ability to say no. Now, you have, literally have the ability, even without changing the land development code, you have the ability to say no in certain circumstances. In right? certain circumstances. Yes, in certain circumstances. <laughs> For example, there was there has been a couple, three in the past that though you could say no to. <laughs> There's some coming up in the future. I know you can say no to. Um, so those things, I think, again, we need to take in consideration. I think your idea is great, and I think it's something that we should definitely look at. But it's also uh, a fact that we realize from the report we had today, and we, we feel that, even though we feel there's some saturation in your area, I'm that the fact, of, the fact of it is we have a lot coming forward, and there's a need for some something like 5,800 units. Is that 10 more apartments? Is that 12 more apartments? And then you're caught up to that? Well, That's why we need to look at how many we have, how many entitlements are already out there can Mr. Chairman, you look how many timelines are out there and see if that needs filled. I guarantee it will be because of how many there are out there. I want to draw Mr. you back. I want to, oh, I'm next, but you can go after. Sorry. Oh, poor Jack's back That's the He's problem going, when you're on, not guys. here. Um, but you can go after me. Um, I want to draw your attention back to what Mr. Tu said about trying to artificially control the market. And um, when you do that, Sometimes, you know, bad things happen. And just because someone's entitled doesn't mean, first of all, they build them all. That, I mean, Starkey Ranch was entitled, maybe someone here can tell me what it was, to a certain number of units and never, never built them all. So the market, you know, and, and market circumstances dictate a lot of what happens here. And I can tell you that um, these guys building these um, expensive apartment complexes have to go out and get financing. Oh. They're not going to get financing if they're going to open up a rental um, unit, a uh, rental complex that doesn't get filled up. I mean, no one's going to give them the money. So the, the demand is here because the need is here. And and because those uh, MPUDs have entitlements, doesn't mean they're building them next year. I've, I've seen it happen where it takes 10, 20 years, 30 years before they actually build out. So, you know, I, I've i asked, and out in the marketplace right now, there's probably three or more developers that are standing there ready to find the right property to build an apartments on because the demand is there Yeah, right now. Yeah. But you're yeah, creating that, you're creating that, demand by building them to come from Hillsborough County is mostly what you're doing. Is That's Mr. exactly Mariano. what you're doing. Mr. Chairman, can you go to uh, Mr. Mariano? No need. Okay. For need. And, and, and it is is very key. I mean, we are in such a hot housing market period. No matter what you build, it's going to fill up. We got to make a look at making a choice. Do you want single family houses, which are the the best demographic going, which has led to the great success in Wesley Chapel Trinity across the board? Those people are paying the taxes along the way. It's great quality of life. 
a big reason why people want to come here. The focus needs to be, as, so, as well as creating jobs, but what type of housing do we want? I don't want us to turn into like a Seminole County where all of a sudden apartment after apartment after apartment, and all of a sudden the demographic shift and it's not as good a place to be anymore. I want Pasco County to, to I'd rather see us take it a little bit slower and have more single family than the apartments. As far as, you know, controlling the market, Commissioner Moore, you brought up a, a great number of moratoriums that were going out there, or discussions are going out there about what they can control. I'm, I'm all about taking a look at that as well. And, you know, frankly, the area we suggested to block off from five, we left out 581 over to Wesley Chapel Boulevard. Maybe we need to look at that again. Uh, because you can take that nice hospital property and go flip that to apartments. When I've already got apartments going there, what am I doing? It goes against the complete... DRI setup that was there before, and now I'm going against that. If there's enough apartment supply that's out there, and you, know, you can talk to developers that own land right now that have apartments, they'd rather see us develop their apartments right there as well. Let's go exactly. with what we've got. We did enough of it already. Before we go flood the market, let's, let the, let's control the market a little bit where we can say, all right, you've got this, this, and this. Go build them over there. That's where the properties are set. And uh, Commissioner Fitzpatrick, I think he had a great idea with the uh, the C2 part. Good idea. Thank you. That was a good, Mr. Chairman. Just yeah, sure. going back, and Commissioner Mariana made a just made a really, really, really good point. He said that if there was such a demand, a lot of the people that currently have their entitlements or the zoning for it would be moving forward. So why haven't they? Okay, good. That's a it's a great point he just well, made. Well, if the demand is so strong, there's thirty percent of rental property out there. The problem is the market isn't looking just for those type of rental properties. They're looking for the forecasted class A rental properties. They don't want the property that we already have. So we have to figure out what we can do with the property that we already have that's sitting there vacant as well. Nothing vacant. There's yeah. nothing vacant. Yeah. There's a demand for a no, certain amount of property. We are, uh, you could get Marcy on the phone um, and to tell you that we had this wonderful plan about getting homeless people off the street into a motel and into a rental home until we ran into, okay, there's no rentals. There's none. So, uh, and I have people calling me because I know some people that have short-term rentals and they're asking, to, uh, asking if they can see if this person would rent them the house rather than it being a short-term rental. Because you know what's happening is that people that had rental homes the, the value's so high on them, that they're all selling them um, to people who are, you know, home but uh, the occupiers. Not, and so mm -hmm. the rental, the houses in the rental market are disappearing. Ask any real estate company. I hang out with a lot of realtors. There's, there's the supply of housing in Pasco mm -hmm. is a real problem. Rental market. Yeah. The, Mr. Chairman, there was one down. There's one down there now. We can, I'll take a picture of it. Maybe um, I can send it to Dan, and he can forward everybody. That has 14 signs out in front of it today. 14 they may signs. Probably just open. Did they, they just, just open? Oh. It takes the a one, couple of years to get to full capacity. But you think that she's making it up? That they're 95 percent is considered full. Um. Could be. I know. I know when I did when I did um, last, and I told you guys about this when I did my mystery calling, as I like to go back to the old school sales days. And I called nine of them. Eight of them had availability that day. One of them said I'd have to wait. I yeah. think it was a week or two weeks. Well, she said that they always have people moving in uh, and moving okay. out. Yeah, that so means they have availability. Ninety-five percent means there's some available. I listen. I'm not saying she's. Right or wrong, I just know she was hired by the apartment developers to give her presentation. So, okay. So, Terry, you want to come back? Right. <laughs> <Mr. Fetch laughs> like, no. <laughs> idea. This, I mean, this is a regular item, so you can make motions to direct us. Yeah, you can make motions and. What? And they need direction, and the same as we do. We need direction. So. Well, you can make your motion on your idea. Okay, I, I would like to. Well, let her make a motion. Her, okay. her, her, well, I wanted Terry to comment on that because what does that mean if we take residential out of C two? Does that get rid of LibWorks? Well, what does that mean? I mean, multifamily. Multifamily. 
Does so, that get rid of multi walkable communities? Walkable? Well, well, certainly I think the inclusion of multifamily as a conditional use within the C2 zoning district achieves the mixed land use objective that that many communities have and I think Pasco has for, for C2 specifically. A lot of the mixed use, however, is taking place in um, MPUDs. Um, that I think that's there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of projects that have brought forward their mix mix of, mix of land uses within the MPUD, and much less in a standard Euclidean zoning district. That's because Which it's is a why, standard Euclidean zoning district, right. and it's not really intended to be mixed use. Exactly. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, you can have your, you can have Euclidean zones that are mixed use zones and act properly Euclidean, um, in terms of how they're how they go through the process and whatnot. But the but the county attorney his uh, observation is. But uh, exact. Sorry. But exactly what you just said. You had properties that had the mixed use. They had commercial mixed in with their multifamilies. They didn't just come in, have multifamilies in that area. They had the whole well, development. Yeah, the, in, in the case of C2 zoning, you're going to look at the entire C2 zoning district, and it's going to have its the permitted uses that are going to be in that C2 zoning district, and it's going to have its conditional uses that are going to be on that C2 zoning district, and it's going to be property by property. Yeah, every, every property owner has various entitlements according to the, to the Euclidean zoning. Um, for much larger projects like in MPUDs, a lot of times there will be a mix of land uses on the same property that ultimately then gets divvied up into separate parcels later on. But it's a, a more integrated community. This is typically what happens when we see mudroom projects, those mixed use trip reduction measure projects when um, developments yeah. come in and they propose quant certain quantities of single family, certain quantities of townhomes, certain quantities of apartments, plus the office, plus the commercial, and they're all happening all together. Those traditionally have been happening in the MPUD setting. Um, so the one thing that I would say in terms of, you know, looking at the mixed use nature of C2, um, it's something that I've said before. We have to take a look at multifamily and what it actually means. It's not just apartments. And we're not, when we're talking about land use, we have to set aside the renter versus owner uh, discussion. Multifamily is everything that's single family detached and more. So single family detached is single family homes. Then single family attached duplexes, townhomes, row homes, courtyard apartments, garden apartments, mid rise, high rise, et cetera is all together in what's considered multifamily. Um, we have to, uh, if, if you're gonna look at multifamily, you really need to parse that out and start to think about, you know, what type of, what types of multifamily exist and what, does, what is the market potential for each of those typologies. Um, and I mentioned in the presentation earlier about understanding the residential marketplace. And that's pretty much, what you need to do, I, I, as I see it, is understand what kind of multifamily is the marketing place looking at. There's different types of multi. It's not all just apartments. It's not all renter even. Some, a lot of it's ownership related. But it, again, putting that aside, it's, to, it's merely to illustrate that there's a that multifamily is a complex block of land use um, that we have to be careful with in order to make sure that we can have mixed land uses, mixed income communities. Um, and places for everybody to live uh, in Pasco. But they could still build in the multifamilies one, multifamily two, multifamily three, and the MPUDs, different zones, and then they can still come and request a zoning change if they really wanted to. But at least this would get them to focus on finding property that's already zoned for multifamilies instead of coming in and taking over the commercial properties. Yes. Yeah. But it, I'm not sure that's the entire picture of it, but that, that's an aspect of it, yes. Can I pile so on a little have, bit? So Thank we'd you. have, oh. so in our C2s, oh. there wouldn't be any more walkability. You can live in a C2. That would be. If you were to remove multifamily as a conditional use, you would increase the probability of not being able to live in C2 zones. 
So I think there's a parcel coming um, on 50, I guess it's 54, because it's before Wesley Chapel Boulevard. That is an age restricted community um, that has retail commercial going to mixed in with it in the front. Um, you know, it's the Jamie Woods property yeah. that has oh, the yes. wildlife corridor. I already said I'm fine with that. Yeah, so oh. so that would be, would that be an example of something we couldn't do where those seniors that are living there couldn't walk out their door and go to a coffee shop or the beauty parlor? Is that, would that be what we're doing here? He's okay. already gone through the pre ups so it wouldn't affect him. I know, but I was saying we can't do that anymore. But they could still come in your car, drive everywhere. But they could still come in front of the board and request a zoning change. Right, that's correct. I'm sorry, Denise Hernandez, Planning and Development. So my understanding of Mr. Woods' property is that their intent is to come in with a master plan. So it'll have both those both components, the commercial component, and uh, the last we spoke of with them is the the uh, age restricted multifamily component. Right, the application that, hasn't come in, but that was the, the discussion we were having. I think we all have to be very careful. If if, um, you look, if you listen to the ULI, again, you didn't listen to it, but some of you did. Um, we are over-retailed. Over-retailed. So that means no, there aren't going to be a whole lot of commercial, not, not going to be a whole lot of commercial building going on. Um, so we're going to we're going to take people's land and I, I think we're going to have a serious slowdown in what we want to see. Maybe that's what y'all want. No um, but it's not what they said that we are, we have way too much commercial and it's going to be the nation changed. as a whole is we're, I'm going to get the ratio wrong, but us compared to Western Europe, we have a hundred times more square foot per capita than they do in Europe yeah, for retail. So now, a lot of that's because indoor, the indoor mall boom that happened in the what 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. But I'm I'm sitting here trying to reimagine US 19, and I think one day 41, maybe. Um, and I'd like to see some of that C2 go away and become multifamily. I mean, I I'm trying to revitalize that corridor, and what you're going to do is kill it, kill it. Well, then they shouldn't have just the apartments in the C2. They should have the whole infrastructure with the commercial, with the... I agree. I agree. With it, not just... Maybe maybe say you can't come in. Um, if you have existing C2, you can't um, switch the whole thing to multifamily. But You have to be mixed use. It has to be a mixed use. Well, I'm fine with that. But you're going to kill these corridors that are old and need attention. Um, that's a very dangerous policy to be thinking about. Sure. Can I ask Commissioner Fitzpatrick a hey. question? Are you, Commissioner, are you thinking the area where we're having the, really the problem? Are you thinking more of that 41, say 41, cut off at 52 to say Bruce B. Downs? Is that what you're thinking in that area for, for this mm -hmm. policy? If you're changing a conditional, if you're taking it out county. of the conditional Euclidean zoning, it would apply countywide. Gotcha. It would not apply just in a particular area. Okay. And I would say 41 needs a redo as well. So oh, that's why I was they, working on yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. It's just, but, um, can I follow, I just, but then that's going to come back into the MPUDs when they come in with their whole community development and like the Starkey Ranch and the Angeline and everything. They have everything set. Left like that. But it has the infrastructure, it has the schools, it has the parks, it has everything within the community. Yeah. And there aren't that many properties like that left that's why they're a lot of them are looking at manatee going south but um two rivers ranch and uh maybe out where commissioner oakley is but you know there are still some big properties for big planned communities but sadly we don't i'd like i mean i think those are great for the county i wish more people had come in with the planned um communities like that but, Chair, I, I, but I, I think this is really dangerous for the reasons I mentioned on US 19 and on 41 that needs a facelift and a redo. Chairman. Okay. So, Terry, you know, I know, um, you know, I asked Mr. Steinsleiter if he doesn't mind to possibly jump in a little bit too. Um, you know, going back to what really brought this about is the area where there's a lot of oversaturation and 
it continues to be, which is that again, that 41 Bruce B. Downs area, not just the 50, not just 54, 56. We're talking about West of Channel Boulevard and some other roads with, within there and some other areas in there and within there. Um, and personally, I mean, it, I think we need to ha know how many entitlements there currently are there. We, we as a board needs to know, we need to know what's available. You know, we really need to do. And that's why I think, you know, in that area, from that point to that point, we need to pause for a while. We need to take a pause and not allow these parcels, like situations that went came up today and in a couple of weeks ago to change the potential commercial or office or um, line industrial or industrial lands to go to multifamily until we know exactly what we're dealing with. Until we, you know, we're just, until, until we actually know how much capacity we have, it's hard to make a really good decision too. So if we keep allowing these things to move forward on every single block, literally, we're just, again, it's turning bad and it's gonna get turning to turn worse. I don't, I don't know what else I need to do to sell it. <laughs> you know, I, it's really not stopping anything. They can always come in front of the board and ask for a rezoning. So if, even if we took out the conditional land use, conditional use of multifamily homes in the C2, oh. they could come back later on or they can always add it back in 10 years from now. I think that's very expensive, takes a lot of time. I think that if the problem area is over here and you're looking for some kind of solution over here, uh, that's very different than the solution we need for the West Pasco area. So, well, you still have your multifamilies one, two, and three in your MPUDs. Uh, well, I don't have MPUDs on US. Um, so, I'm I'm not okay with with the idea of doing something countywide like that. But if you can think of some way um, to um, see what's happening over here, I. I don't feel I have an accurate picture yet, but I just want to reiterate again, just because yet you have the entitlements doesn't mean you're using them. And I've seen that over and over and over again. Um, oh, that's correct. You're right. Mr. Gotcha. The, the, so. the there. Um, We're not I don't, they won't build them. If it's they will C2, not build them unless they can come the back in front of the there, board so. and still request his own change. Right. And that's why my, again, my fear lies is that so many of Who the impudies and such, you know, we, now I've heard, forward. yeah, some are moving forward in the, in the future, but right now they're not. If the demand is right. so high, so high that's, that's that somebody's willing to walk up well, and to buy that parcel tomorrow, that tomorrow from them, and just take it off they're going to the take it. And that's, that's, that is what's happening. I think the demand We're is, gonna is look very for high. No, it's not. It's the opposite because they're not going to the properties where the entitlements are. <laughs> Thank you. Have something very high. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, Best you know, apartments in the country I, for class apartments. Oh, just, wait a minute. Well, let's put them on. You can get some of the Mariana. Yeah. Yeah. Help out 19. That's what I... So, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Mariana is... Oh, yeah. So, oh, help yeah. out 19. Focus on helping them out. They need help. Give them uh, a chance. So, and, and the Commissioner Starker brings up a good point about US 19. We, we do need the density there. That's a different type of corridor. Um, I think the corridor in the Westview Chapel area that we've blocked out might be looked at a little bit closer. Maybe we need to do a little bit more. I think what happens is when you are so easy to change a zoning to let a development come in, such as the apartments, it takes away the product viability of the ones that are sitting there already that's been zoned for it. So by making it easier and easier, it's just easy to go, I'll just go get a rezoning change rather than go prop buy property over there to go. If we've designed this how we want it to be, put the cars we want it to be, the developments we want it to be, how we wanted it to be, then before we actually have to go bring in more new fresh apartments, let's let's go focus on those. And if there's a message out there that we're going to have to go develop those first before we're going to let any other apartments go in, it's going to drive them to where we wanted to go in the first place. Just, Mr. Chairman, one more thing, and I'll probably get it. I'm probably okay. done. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, 
Well, I mean, this is this is very important. No, I, agree, I agree with you. <laughs> how important it is to our citizens that live there. I will let them all email you so they can tell you how it is. I've told them to hold off on that, but I think they need to open the floodgates, to be honest with you. Um, but there's so many people in, in, in developments and developers that have done the things so right in a very, very successful communities around here. Uh, you know, I can go down the road. I'll say like Starkey and um, Starkey Ranch and, and Wire, Wiregrass and all these developments, master plan communities that have done it right. They've done the things the right way. What's not being done right is plopping these places up, these multifamily apartment buildings on every corner in that area. That's not good development. That's not being done right because that does not end up being a walkable community we all talk about. That's not there. Right. But these other developments have gone through the process. They put the time in to do it right. They're literally just going in, asking you to rezone this piece of land, plop it up an apartment complex, and they're gone. The debt gets paid off in you know, 10, 15, 20 years, and see you later. That's not a long-term investment in the community. These developments and things I've talked about, I just talked about, are long-term investments in the community. The one we talked about earlier this oh, yeah. morning at New River is a long-term, well-planned-out development for the future. Metal Point's very well-planned-out development for the future. You know, those aren't coming forward you know? that quickly. Within that five years, they're not coming forward. So just, It'll take time. We just got to stop plopping well, these things up on every corner. That's My goal is just to try to have them start looking out and reaching out to the multifamilies one, two, and three first. So I would like to motion to direct the staff to begin the process of amending the land development code to remove the multifamily as a conditional use for the C2. No way. Well, what she's asking is to bring it back. Yeah. So she's asking to bring it back. You look it over. Well, she's that's she's made a motion. If she gets yeah. a second to, to yeah. start the process, that's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. It'll br they'll bring it back for you to look at. You're not voting on doing anything today. Okay. I second. We'll take a look at that. A uh, question: Are apartments allowed in MF one? Yes. Apartments, as, are, as I said earlier today, it's all multifamily. Yeah, it's yeah. not apartments. It's not condos. It's all multifamily. So what's that's your multifamily okay. zoning What's the difference category? between, I'm sorry, I don't have it memorized. What's the difference between MF1, MF2, and MF3? Yeah, Denise knows. The amount of right. homes. Okay. Sure, the difference is basically, uh, there are two differences, the building height and also the density. So MF1, you've got 12 dwelling units per acre. Two, it's 18. And then three goes up to 24. Have you ever seen apartments at 12 per acre? Um... Yes, because the land use actually limited them also. They were actually in Res 12. So, yes, I have seen that. Very small complex. Today's project Very was small. 13. Yeah, yeah today yeah. was 13. So, the motion is to read it back. Do you want me to repeat that? The motion was to, to direct staff to begin the process of amending the land development code yes. to delete. B2 as a conditional yes. use from okay. multifamily. Did I have a second on that? Or multifamily. I, I have a second. Yeah. And I have a second. Okay. Um, I have a motion and a second by roll call. Wait, I'm sorry. Can you tell me what the motion is again? <laughs> okay. The motion that the commissioner put on the floor was to direct staff to begin the process of amending the land development code to remove multifamily as a conditional use in the C2 zoning category. Not to bring it back for discussion, but to start changing the well, code. You have to still vote to on To begin it. public hearings. Right. Yeah, so you got to bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. Doing it. yeah, there'll be three of them. Okay. Um, under discussion, I would say let's do a workshop to understand what that means, because we haven't done a workshop on that. Well, we have to vote. So well, I got a motion. Start doing public hearings on the LDC land development code like that. So I'll be opposing it. We have a motion and a second, though. So by roll call vote. Aye. I'm not on. I'm going to redo that. <laughs> District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Nay. District four, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. 
District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed four to one. Okay. Mr. Chairman, this is again, I don't, this is really isn't a motion. And I think Commissioner Starkey was in agreement with what I was talking about earlier. Um, can we kind of have a date certain? No, 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 not on that. <laughs> that you, we, you bring back the amount. I mean, you could do it. I think it probably should be countywide, to be honest with you, that countywide bring back to this board how many entitlements are for multifamily across the county because we need to know that yeah then you also need to bring back the history of how m what percentage of those right. entitlements actually get used well and, and, no, no, and no, i think I, no, to a well, i mean in the future yeah. we'll to complicate it further you have the looms that mean you can switch uses between different things during the process after the board approval so you got there's several different levels there that we're gonna have to work on so that that would be in your mpuds where you right. have land use exchange mechanisms it wouldn't right. be in your straight categories correct but i think they're asking for what we have in our mpuds the entitlements are in the mpuds it doesn't have to be in an mpud a lot of them are mpuds or dri it, it doesn't matter what it is well, what mr stein's letter whatever maybe it's either an MPUD or it's straight zoning. Straight zoning too. Right. Yeah, it doesn't have to be MPUD. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we have the straight zoning numbers. Okay. I mean, it's the MPUDs that is the, the large challenge. Right. We can dig into every one of them and come back with some numbers. So but that's not an overnight task. Okay. I, I know it's not I'm overnight. Sure but we need to, I'm we not need sure to have we're them. giving him enough direction, but yeah. somehow those that have more questions, they would direct to Terry to answer based on this issue we're talking about today, I think you need to do that. So you have better, if you don't understand it correctly, so you have a better understanding. Cool. So to continue that state, well, you know, one of the big reasons we came here today was because of, you know, what the issue is, you know, and probably because I brought it up, I would assume, um, in the area where we have the, the oversight. We really haven't addressed, Commissioner Pastor Patrick helped out, made a motion to bring that back to us. But right now we have this ongoing saga of people bringing in or coming in for these reasons. We really haven't addressed that, you know, a lot in that area. You know, we talk about, quote, moratoriums. Um, I don't consider it really a moratorium. If you look at a certain section of the county, say again, I'm using 41 to Bruce B. Downs. That unless you already have obviously entitlements or you've come in front or, or, or similar to what we did with um, the storage units, unless you've already in the, I don't want to say um, pre app because three people have had pre apps five years ago, <laughs> um, unless you've already submitted that we put a pause. We have a pause for a while. Until all this information can come back, we can make have better decision making. Be a moratorium, yeah. even if it's a smaller area of the county. Right, well, I, what I'm, at the same time, what I'm saying is it's not a, what we're doing is still allowing the people that, again, that have their current entitlements, and if they have already gone through mm -hmm. um, the, the application process. I'm, right. We unless carve out want, the others. Unless you want to, yeah. this is for future. Pass an ordinance, a moratorium ordinance staff cannot refuse applications right so in the in the um when it came to the storage units you did a moratorium but if people were already going through the process you can you can carve out that's what i'm people saying people that, yeah. that can still move forward right but you still have to do the moratorium if that's what the goal of the board is no i understand i understand okay. what you're saying but we still again it's not fair to not if somebody already has the entitlements and right. somebody have already started the pre doesn't mean we need to say yes i want to remind everybody that doesn't mean you need to see say yes but they can still go through they started the process let them finish go for the planning commission coming through this board that from again from i'd say bruce B, i don't think commissioner starkey wants to see it maybe she does um on the southern portion of 41 but from 41 to 52 all the way up to Bruce B. Downs is where I'd like to see it happen. 
I, I don't want it in my district. I'd like to see that all redeveloped. Okay. So I'd say, so my motion would be from the corner of 41 north, stopping at 52. O'Connor. Be down. So Bruce B. Downs. Bruce B. Downs. Well, Carterton already has their title. Connor Carterton has entitlements. Yeah. They're all, you're not messing with anybody that already has their entitlements. And people that already have their applications and we're not stopping them. From going through the process. You don't have to say yes at any time, but right. you're, yes, they can already continue on with the process. Once they've started. It's not fair for somebody that's already started the process. So, or purchase their or, land. Say they've already purchased it. Well, typically nobody's typically, let me jump in. Typically what you're seeing come in front of us, they have a, no, they haven't they made. They haven't actually closed on a piece of land until they've gotten their entire their uh, zoning. Oh. And Mr. Steins already probably attested that. That's what you see in front of you all the time. Nobody's typically closed on their land until they go through the process. Oh. That sure doesn't make good the, business sense. I'm not sure whether the market has gotten quite hot enough to do that to take that chance, anyway, right? Anyway, yeah, <laughs> that's a big chance. I think they leave that open. Can I, yeah. So it's, okay, so it's can I go ahead. try to make sure I understand the geographic yeah. boundaries? So you're saying, let me start with 41 to 52 across to come down 75 or go 52 all the way to the county line. I would love to see, can we have a map come up real quick? Yeah, we can put a map that up might there. Be better. We, uh, one of the slides. Is there a laser pointer? If you just go to yeah, the Yeah, we don't have a laser pointer. <laughs> presentation. I just want to make sure we have the right boundary before you have a discussion. I appreciate that. I, I'm. Yeah, they'll, they'll bring it up in a I'm second. Confused at the eastern and southern boundary. I, I, I got the west yeah. and north. Because I wouldn't bring up the. Because I wouldn't sure if you were taking forty-one to the county line or to fifty-four either. Well, I, I was looking for a wait for a map. I thought we were. Oh, no. I just going to wait for that. Projects that are moving that are inbound. It would be paid on slide eight of the staff presentation as a good map to use. Um, we're, we're, getting the county line, so. we're getting it. We're getting it. While he's loading that, if I could ask the attorney a question. Um, so, at what process are people grandfathered? At what point in the process? Or what? I don't even understand the question. Grandfather, grandfathered from what? I guess is Moving what forward I. with the plan. So, it, Next slide. So at today's board meeting, if you make this if you make this policy shift, you can say in the ordinance that you adopt later that any applications that were filed on today's day or before get to move forward. Or you can wait until the ordinance hearing and say any applications that were filed up to today's ordinance. But Smith versus the city of Clearwater says that it once there once the public is on notice that you're changing your policy, you can you can pick that date, which I would say would be to today would be a conservative day. Does, yeah. does that answer your question, Commissioner? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't have to move again. Something may come in front of us. Doesn't mean you have to approve it. It's just they started the application process and or actually it doesn't yeah, mean you have to start. they started that process and you can hear them in the public hearing. Oh boy. Um, okay. <laughs> so this is the map showing the urban service area. I would like to do one that actually we can, you know, myself and probably those at home district. can actually tell what roads hmm? are. Say his district. It's, are you looking at just your district? Can we just say your district? Uh, I am. Yeah. Part, uh, well, not all of it, a portion of it. Not all, not all that district. The area where I feel that we have the most in the oversaturation, the problem lies, and it's a portion of that area. Uh -huh. Well, I think it's important for, yeah, okay. 41 north to 52, which would be the south side of that portion of the road, okay? You know, you know what I'm saying? Okay, we're not going across 52, for example. And then come up hmm. to where Bruce B. Downs is. 
without come up to like Donald Pascal on the inside. I'm not including. I'm not including 52. In, inside of 52, up to Bruce B. Downs. Bruce, yeah, you take Wesley Chapel, Wesley Chapel Boulevard is included to Bruce B. Downs. Yes. You got it. You got it, right? Well, I, that, I, well, whatever I can get Commissioner Starkey to support. I don't think there's anything <laughs> left. Um, I don't, <laughs> I don't think there's anything south of 54. You're probably uh, right. On the northern, you've got... Uh, Northwood, know, Northwood Lakes. Lake. True. Yeah. I think it's all built. And there's already those apartment complexes there, and another one already bought it. All done. Okay. So. I, I understand your boundaries. Yeah. So this is 54 North. I, I understand your boundaries. Get over there. Team is already telling me to mess up their time. I, I, I am. We but I mean, we're, you, you understand the lines, then. We're good. Yeah, I understand the lines. Okay. What? I guess so. I'll make I'll, uh, the rest of the motion. That well, that that was yeah. That's part of the motion. So what's your motion? Okay. So we we put a a, a pause on any uh, rezonings or apartments. Well, that would also, Mr. Steinberg, sorry, besides rezonings, that would also that we would need to, yeah, a multifamily. That would include, no, you can actually carve it out, but um, <coughs> besides straight rezonings, there's also, there's other things we would want to, we would want to include in that as well. Well, you, it would be rezonings, conditional use approvals. Right. Yep. You're, you've said that if, if it's an MPUD and they're entitled, you're not stopping You're not touching that. that. Right. They're already entitled. They're already entitled. Yeah. Assisted living, some of it. Yeah, you can carve that out. Just the living facilities are actually are actually separate. Yeah, that's a different deal. That's not. Yeah, they're actually separate because we've actually done rezonings. For, we've actually taken apartments, multifamily, and rezoned that parcel or changed the changed what that zoning the, to. What's the timeline of the policy? Pardon me. We're going to pause for how long? Well, until yeah. we can, until staff can bring back what was requested about how many and parcels in that area have that zoning, the well, current the zoning or current yeah. entitlements. The pause would be specified by your ordinance, which is what the commissioner is directing, mm -hmm. not that the pause oh, start well, today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All so, right. Well, yeah, we can't I start said, it today. <laughs> as I said, you, you've, no. got, you've got to adopt a moratorium ordinance that's going to require a hearing before your planning commission. It's going to require two hearings before your board. Before this. Wait, so I thought he was talking about something separate from what she was talking about. Mm. Mm -mm. Ethan? I don't think so. Well, we can't do it. We can't, you can't do it today. It has to go to a public hearing commission. I can't, we can't just vote on it today. But, but it can be re retroactive to today. Right. Yeah. But aren't you bringing up something different than what we are? He's on. talking about a monitor. That's totally, that's totally yeah. separate. That's totally separate yeah. things. Yeah. 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 She's you're on the same page. That, but but the moratorium ordinance that he's asking for has to go through the same process. Same <laughs> process. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So what the time frame would be, pursuant to how long it's going to take you guys to bring. Work, I guess. Um, well, how long do you think? Four months, five months, three months, six months? What do you think? Well, if well, I, 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 yeah, I wouldn't do a moratorium short in 180 days. It's going to take us at least 90 to 120 days to do the MPD research. And keep in mind, at the same time, the building numbers have doubled, actually tripled in January. You're, we're seeing the same thing in long range and current planning. Okay. So you're, we have we have a resource constraint issue. So I would. I would, if you're going to do a moratorium, do it for 180 days with the ability to extend it. Okay, 180 days. And 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 I think we can get it done faster, but okay. we're resource constrained, and we don't want to slow down the rest of the process okay. that okay. doesn't apply. This doesn't apply. I'll say 180 days, but if you are able to get that done 
before that, you can always we have the option to you can always cancel it. Cancel it. I want to make sure everybody understands the lines, right? Yeah, I I would have said keep it in the urban urban service. Boundary that's pretty much. Area, but that's, you included a whole sure. bunch of land. Where? I took out fifty two. Forty one to Bruce B. Downs well, to fifty two. Like a, a lot of that's not in the urban service boundary. Well, well, that's why I'm going to vote against. It. It's too too broad for me. Okay. okay. So, uh, that, we, don't, so okay. we don't vote on that today. We just, well, we, no, it's making a motion for more. Oh, that's a motion. Yeah, that's my motion. Oh, okay, I have a question. Are you starting it from today or the date of the ordinance? Mm -hmm. Or like if someone's been working for the past two years on a project and they're getting ready to submit their paperwork, well, they've just wasted the past year and it's already shut out. I don't or are you giving it. them a if, month? If, Here's my answer to you. If you're supportive and you would like it to be on the date of the first public hearing, I'm fine with that. You good with that? Can you that explain that? Like? He's just saying that the, that instead of being retroactive to today, yeah, he he would accept as a friendly amendment, I guess. Yes. <laughs> that, <laughs> the, that the it would be the day, whatever day staff gets the ordinance in front of in front of you to adopt okay. that would be the day that the moratorium that starts. start okay is that good for you okay okay thank you commissioner mariana you you okay with that i was okay even before the day change okay <laughs> <laughs> well I, I don't want to split hairs you know i i, I got three of you now i've so. got a motion who was second <laughs> you get with that commissioner no have a second so you're going to take three months to bring the ordinance to us mm -hmm. What is one, 180 days? No, how many? That's six months. Well, the, the, or, the moratorium ordinance is different than the I know. research we asked about. You said it would take 180 days. To do the research. To do the research. That's not what he said. Well, the research is involved in the ordinance, right? No. Okay, can we restate the missing? motion? <laughs> yeah, because I heard 180 days with that little friendly amendment. I I heard it was 180 days. All right, before bring the it. first year. I want to make sure that my team grabs. No, 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 no. You're break. Oh, wait. <laughs> Getting confused okay. with this somehow. No, 108. It's going to be 180. 180 days is the length of the moratorium from the date of now the amendment of the first public hearing. When will the first public hearing be? Two weeks. No. No, no it won't be two he's, weeks. No, he's got to do the research. So, to put it in oh, the no, 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 no. The moratorium. No. 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 The, the, that's the, the time you do the no research. bearing on the moratorium. It's the same thing you that's the date um, he asked. Yeah. He wanted to know how long it would take us to do the research so that the moratorium could extend past yeah. how long it would take to do the research. But getting the moratorium in place is, you know, planning commission yeah. and then two board hearings to do that. And same thing you did with the you um, gotta do public storage notice and all that. So, and draft it. So, probably 90 days. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's what you did with the storage units because you they had it, you know, you instructed them to go and do the research and bring it back to you. So, but your hearings came within a month or two weeks. Okay. It, yeah, if I may, Mr. Chairman, it, the preparation for the moratorium, considering the process to the county attorney's point, it's probably 90 days, maybe a little longer than that, given the whatever the timelines are to line things up. Um, to get them to the right hearings. Um, but I do want to note that there's a limit to the geographic area that's been defined, but I'm not quite clear about what the problem that needs to be defined in the moratorium. In the case of the self-storage, there was the argument of the uh, preserving the economic development potential along the corridors. That was clearly identified in that, in that uh, directive when we were told to bring forward a moratorium on that. So I guess my question would be is what is the problem that the moratorium addresses? What's the benefit that the well, moratorium is providing? This is what, what we did was gave you the time to go research how many current entitlements that we have correct. in that area. So that's, from from uh, Brisbane that's down to 41. Right. And that's the geographic. And, and, and you're going to bring that back north so to we can 52. make a solid decision moving forward. So if it's not in the urban area, you wouldn't have that, right? Mr. Steinsler. Is that what you're saying? I mean, right. That's so, my direction from So I think the problem that the that you're trying to address is the oversaturation of multifamily, Correct. perceived oversaturation of multifamily in the area you have described and whether or not 
the county needs additional regulations on multifamily so that that doesn't continue going forward. Right, and this is the time we're giving staff to go ahead and do that research and bring that due diligence and bring that information back to us so we can make a logical and sensible and give us further forward. direction once you once you know the information. So you stated you think it's going to take 90 days to bring what I just what we just talked about uh, back to us. No, no what I, I was referring to the process itself. Okay. When it well, comes time okay. to bring okay. the moratorium forward. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Generally, my experience has been that it's taken about 90 days to the start of a land development code amendment to the end of a land development code amendment once it's ready. Okay. And so this is yeah. relatively a simple, I mean, it's the moratorium. The moratorium the is solution. simple. The solution right. is not. Yes. I solution is not the moratorium. Yes. Okay. All right. Motion by Mr. Moore. Yep. I would like to have the motion stated on the record. Well, I've, we've done it like three times. <laughs> I know, but I want to make sure oh, it's clear because we're keeping it for the record. I hear what you're saying, Mr. Steinsnyder. The moratorium is for. The moratorium is for. But what's, oh, what is the <laughs> they, they have, they, they, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, but they have it on record they're recording it right now if you need to if you need to put it back in the record you just need to listen to you just, the, repeat just it? listen to what the statements we made and, and the motion that was made no. can you repeat the motion please thank you sir commissioner <laughs> with the with the with the amendment so i may i'll make it simple we're doing so the 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 motion is to do a moratorium on rezonings for multi-family apartment Multi-family. Multi-family. I'm sorry. Multi-family multi 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 from the corner of U the the, <laughs> the northern corner of US 41 to the southern corner of State Road 52, not to include State Road 52 going east all the way up to Bruce B. Downs, and also including Wesley Chapel Boulevard and all areas in between that would be south of 52. Yeah, south of 52, That's west of 75, south of the little piece of Wesley Chapel Boulevard, then yeah. west of Bruce B. Downs and north of 54. It's not the easiest to state that for the record. That's why I was trying to use a map. <laughs> I, I have that. The boundaries was clear. It was um, the moratorium in the 180 days is in, in addition to included in that more in, included no, into your motion. It shouldn't be included in the motion. Right. Not the 180. Okay. That would be in the final ordinance. Ornate, it right. The ordinance should be in the motion. That's the right. Can, I want to make it they clear. Can decide, they can decide how long they want the ordinance moratorium to be when it gets here. Um, it takes effect on the day of the first public hearing. It would be retroactive to the day of the first public hearing. Now, the only thing you didn't have in your motion this time that you did the first time was conditional conditional uses. uses. And yes. C2. Yes, yeah, so I'm sorry, say it one more time. C2 conditional use. You only said multifamily homes. You didn't say multifamily homes or conditional use C2. Reasonable Cons multifamily. Right. Rezoning. Yes. Or conditional. Yes. Thank you. Or conditional use. For multifamily. Yes. Thank you. Okay. We all, we good? And we got a second? Yeah. Second. Thank you. Oh, second. Yeah. Jack uh -huh. seconded. By roll call vote. Uh, okay. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. No. District four, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District five, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District one, Chairman Oakley. Nay. Oh. Uh, motion passed three to two. All right. Okay. Is that everything? That's we all clear. I, I, that's all we got. Clear as mud. <laughs> so. No, I think we're good. That was a long one today. Oh yeah. Who, who, who calls that? that? I'm not late. <laughs> that's, uh, all right. We stand adjourned.